Hello, my name is Jessica McDonald and welcome to How to Knit Your First Sweater. In this class, I'm gonna walk you through the entire process of knitting this sweater that I have on. This sweater design is called Wood Smoke. It is a very simple, beginner-friendly pattern that I wrote a couple years ago. It is perfect for your first sweater and I decided to use this one to walk you through the entire sweater from cast on to drying it off after blocking. If you would like to knit this exact same pattern along with me, you can find links to the pattern in the description box below. I'm going to include a little discount for this pattern so that you can enjoy a discount on your very first sweater pattern and then we can knit it together. This discount code will never expire. So you can head down into the description, you can pause this video, head down into the description box below, go purchase this pattern and print it off if you would like to walk through this entire process with me. If you want to use this tutorial to walk you through a different sweater, I would advise you to choose a circular yoke sweater, but it can be adapted to a raglan yoke sweater. The difference between a circular, circular yoke is that all of the increases are spread out in a circular fashion. In a raglan style sweater, the increases are worked along the shoulder lines. And there'll be a line from the neck out to the shoulder, both in the front and in the back. You can adapt this tutorial for a raglan construction sweater, but this tutorial is going to specifically focus on a circular yoke and specifically this sweater wood smoke. If you would like to use this tutorial to knit your first color work sweater, I do have a couple of excellent options. There is my fletching, which is a very simple color work circular yoke sweater, and also blizzard, which is a very simple circular, circular yoke color work sweater. I do have a tutorial on how to knit color work. I used this sweater to demonstrate in that tutorial. I'll put a link in the description box below to my how to knit color work tutorial, along with links to these two sweater patterns in case you wanna make your first sweater also your first color work sweater. But I will be demonstrating on this and I will not include a tutorial section on how to knit color work in this tutorial. So once you have your sweater pattern, whether it's wood smoke or a different one, I want you to print it out. I have it here printed. If you want to work your work from a device, have your pattern on your iPad or your phone, that's okay, but I do strongly prefer printing out the pattern. That way I can circle all the numbers I need, I can mark things off if I need to. I just find it a lot easier to work from a printed pattern, so I advise you to print it out. You can also fold it in half, like so, and it will fit neatly into your knitting bag. So the first thing we are going to do is we're going to choose our size because we are not gonna know how much yarn we need to buy until we choose our size. So we're gonna look here on our pattern. We have the sizes listed here and then the finished measurements down below. In my patterns, the sizes are listed as the finished measurements in inches of all of the sweaters. It is the finished measurement of the sweater. It's not the measurement of your chest. It's the finished measurement of the sweater itself. A lot of designers list their sizes differently. Some will list a small, medium, large. Some will list based off of the size of chest it's designed to fit. But in my patterns, I always list the sizes as the finished measurement of the sweater itself. So if you are working from someone else's pattern, you may need to turn to the schematics. It's usually the very last page of the pattern. It will have a little drawing of the sweater with all of the areas where the measurement is taken, and then it will have all of the measurements listed up above it, or actually on the graphic itself. It depends based on the designer. Everybody has their own style for how to do it. I do it like this, where you have the, measure, the little drawing with the place where all the measurements are taken, and then above that is all of the measurements for the sweater. So you may need to turn to the schematic to find all of the measurements, but in my patterns underneath the sizes, I list the finished measurements. This is the chest circumference, the finished chest circumference of the sweater. You can see it is listed in both inches and centimeters. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take a flexible measuring tape and you're going to measure yourself. There are two places you can measure yourself. You can measure yourself at the upper bust, which is right underneath the armpits. It's not at your full bust, which is basically at nipple level. It is immediately under your armpits. You can take that measurement there. For me, that's 37 inches. Or you can take your full bust measurement. For me, that's 36 and a half inches. You wanna take both measurements and choose your size based off of the larger measurement. So maybe your upper bust is larger, maybe your full bust is larger. Measure both and choose your size based off of the larger measurement. I'm going to come in here into the finished measurement section. Underneath there, it says how much ease you should wear this sweater with. Positive ease is how much the sweater is bigger than you. Negative ease is how much the sweater is smaller than you. Zero degree, zero inches, not zero degrees, zero inches of ease means the sweater fits you perfectly like a second skin. In all of my designs, I go for positive ease. Other designers may do negative ease. So you're going to want to read how much ease the designer recommends. Do not go outside of the recommended ease. If you go outside of the recommended ease, like you choose a tighter fit or a looser fit than the designer recommends, you're asking for trouble because when we design patterns, we design it for a certain amount of ease to be worn with on the body. So on wood smoke here, it says to be worn with two to six inches slash five to 15 centimeters positive ease. That means you take your 37 inch chest circumference and you add two to six inches. So if I add two inches, I'm at 39 inches. If I add six inches, I'm to 43. So I need to go between 39 inches and 43 inches. I wanna choose a size in that range. So I'll look at the finished measurements. I have 38, I have 42, 46. Really the only size that is within my recommended level of ease which would be two to six inches of positive ease. So 37 inch chest plus two to six inches, which gives me a 39 to 43 inch range. I wanna choose size 42 because that is the one that falls within the recommended amount of ease for this sweater. Once you've chosen your size, circle it. Always have a pen handy, that's why I like it printed out. Circle it, that way you don't forget. I am going to make the three month size of the sweater. I'm gonna make the tiniest little baby size, that way I can film hopefully quickly, and also the entire sweater will fit into the frame so that I can demonstrate things to you better. So after you have circled your size, you're gonna come down into the yarn section. And the yarn section tells you what yarn is this sample is knit with. Usually I will tell you how many skeins you need. I haven't updated that yet. I need to update that. I'm going to write myself a note so that I can update that. So by the time you see this pattern, it will have number of skeins of this exact yarn you need to knit your sample. Then underneath the number of skeins of the sample yarn, you will see the exact yardage numbers listed. You can see them here. The exact yardage, and I've also got it listed in meters. And then you can come over here, and it will tell you what weight yarn we're using. So we're using sport weight yarn. If you don't want to use the exact same yarn I used, or the designer used in the sample, you can go look at what weight yarn was used in the sample, what weight yarn this pattern is written for, and you can go shop for a different yarn in that same yarn weight. And you can look at your yardage information, all these numbers, and you can figure out how many yards of sport weight yarn you need for your size, and then you can go buy that much yarn. Depending on what yarn you choose, your 240 estimated yards may not come out to a round skein. I'm going to use this yarn, which is 185, yeah, I think it's 185 yards per skein. So that comes to 370 yards total 
for these two skeins. 185 yards isn't enough. I need to have two skeins, which gives me 370, is that what I said? To 370 yards, which is more than I need, but I need to have two skeins to get to my 240 yards. So you're probably going to have leftover yarn. I don't see that as a problem, honestly. <laughs> um, so by the number, the amount of yarn you need, your yards or number of skeins listed in the pattern, get them wound up and ready to go. And then we're going to talk about gauge swatching. Here's the first page of our pattern here, and it tells you your sizes, the yarn you need, and over here it tells you all of the tools you need and your gauge right here. So we're going to come up into our needle section and we're going to look at what size needle we need to use. We need one 32 inch US size 5. I have it listed in centimeters and also the size listed in millimeters. Depending on where you are in the world, sizes are described differently. That way you don't have to convert things. You can just look at the pattern and know what size you need. Now look at this little note here, or size needed to obtain gauge. Depending on your individual gauge, you may use a different size needle than I did. Gauge is a very, very individual thing. Do not get upset if you cannot get the same gauge on the same size needle as the designer did. It's a very, very individual thing. So we need a US size five for our main needle, and we need one 32 inch US size three or two whole sizes smaller than gauge needle, circular ne knitting needles. I have a little note here saying you may want a longer circular needle if you're knitting one of the larger sizes. Here are my needles, this one's out already. Get both of your needles, pop them in your knitting bag so that you have them handy when you need them. Now let's talk about the length of the circular needle. I tell you to use a 32 inch needle. I say that because a 32 inch needle is the most commonly used size. I think most everybody has a 32 inch needle. It's kind of the default size. Um, you don't necessarily need to use a 32 inch needle. You can see that my size three needle is a 40 inch needle and I'm gonna use it anyway because I don't know where my 32 inch needle is. You don't ha necessarily have to use the exact same length that's listed in the pattern. You just need to have a length that's long enough to accommodate all of the stitches when you are at the largest part of the pattern. So when you have the most stitches will be right here at the bottom of the yoke. That's going to be your largest number of stitches. You need to have a circular needle long enough to accommodate all of those stitches. So if you're knitting a baby size like this, a 24 inch circular needle might be long enough to accommodate all of the stitches around the bottom of the yoke. If you're knitting the 70 inch size, you may need a 48 inch circular needle to accommodate all of the stitches on the yoke. It's okay if your neckline is not wide enough to fit all the way around your yoke. This is a it is okay if your neckline stitches are not enough to fit all the way around this circular needle. There is not going to be any neckline ever that fills up a whole 32 inch circular needle. If you have a 32 inch neckline, that's way too big. You're never gonna fill up the entire cable and the entire needle with your neckline stitches. And that's okay. You don't need to fill it all the way up. We're gonna use the magic loop method and I'll show you that when we cast on. If you want to use a much shorter needle when you cast on so that you have the stitches going all the way around, you can use a 16 inch or maybe even go down to a nine inch to, to, so that your stitches for your neckline fill up the whole cable, but then you're gonna have to swap out your, cable, your needle just as soon as you begin knitting the increases of the yoke, which means you're gonna have more needles on hand, which gets expensive if you're buying a lot of needles. So I'm gonna show you how to knit your whole sweater on a 32 inch circular, circular needle, unless you're knitting one of the larger sizes and need a longer needle. That way you don't have to go around buying a ton of needles. Now we're gonna come down notions, one stitch marker, waist yarn, and a tapestry needle. The tapestry needle you need at the very end when you're weaving in ends. You want one stitch marker right away. Just make sure you pin one to the side of your bag or you have one handy. I always 
here's my knitting bag. It's got the little tag. The this this need, this bag is no longer available, but it's got the little tag on it, and I just hook a few removable stitch markers to my bag, and then I always have stitch markers handy. For waist yarn, you can use, you can just grab your second skein and pull a little length off of there, or you can grab a little piece of leftover yarn from a different project and just toss it in your bag so it's ready to go. But you're gonna need your waist yarn when we split for sleeves. So we won't need that right off the bat. Then we're down here to gauge. 24 stitches and 36 rounds equals four inches or 10 centimeters. Four inches and 10 centimeters is the exact same. Come down here, four inches is here, 10 centimeters is there. It's maybe a teeny tiny bit off, but it's basically the same length. That's why gauge is listed over four inches slash 10 centimeters because it's basically the same length. That way, no matter where you are in the world, you have a measurement that works for you and you don't have to convert the measurements. Now it's gonna tell you what size needle you use to knit your gauge swatch with. So you're gonna take your size five needles and your already wound yarn and you're gonna cast on to knit a little square. Here's an example of one of my gauge swatches. You want a big gauge swatch. If you mess up your gauge swatch, your sweater will not fit at all. So you can see this is for the color work sweater I'm currently working on. I've swatched for the color work and I have a big section where I've swatched just plain stockinette because this says here in stockinette on US size five needles. Your gauge between regular stockinette and color work might be different. You might have to use a different size needle for color work than you would for just the plain stockinette parts of the sweater. That's a little bonus tip since we're not knitting color work in this sweater. You want to make sure it's big. We're measuring over four inches, but we're gonna knit at least five or possibly six inches in our gauge swatch. I don't want you to knit a border along the sides. You see, this is just raw stockinette on the edge. I don't want you to knit garter stitch along the edge because garter stitch has a much shorter row gauge than stockinette does. So if you have two columns of garter stitch along the sides of your swatch, it's gonna pull your swatch down at the edges and it's gonna distort all of the stitches along the edge. You can see in this swatch, I tried two different edgings. I tried ribbing at the bottom and garter stitch at the top, and you can see the ribbing is pulling in the bottom of the, of the swatch. So these stitches down here are gonna be distorted and they're not gonna give me a good measurement. So <clears throat> if you're going to knit a border, then you need to knit a little section of stockinette before you get into your four inches of stockinette. So make sure you make your gauge swatch really Big. It's okay if you're using a ton of yarn, you can just cannibalize it later. Or maybe if you think, if you have a lot of trouble getting gauge with things, you might wanna just buy an extra skein of yarn just for swatching purposes. If you're knitting your gauge swatch flat, which this one is knit flat, you can take it out later and use this yarn again. This one is knit flat, it's knit on the front side and then on the back side a pearl cross it. This is because this was for a cardigan that was knit flat. Since this sweater is knit in the round, we're going to want to knit a circular gauge swatch. This swatch was knit in the round. So I cast on down here and I joined it magic loop style. I'm going to include a, a link down below for how to knit magic loop. It's a whole tutorial on magic loop. So if you're knitting your gauge swatch, and you need help with Magic Loop right now, you can head down there and get the tutorial for Magic Loop. I knit this in the round as a little tube. We're basically just knitting a little tube here, and then I cut it over here, and I cut it apart. I just, I didn't do any reinforcement. I just cut it up the middle. This is where we begin and end. I just cut it up the middle so that I have a gauge swatch knit in the round, and then block it, lay it flat, Block it. To block your gauge swatch, you're going to soak it in warm water with wool wash for about 15 to 20 minutes. Then you're gonna drain the water, squish it, don't wring it, squish it, wrap it in a towel, get as much excess water out as you can. Then you're gonna lay it flat. You're not going to pin it. 
Do not stretch it and pin it out because if you stretch it and pin it out, you're going to end up with a distorted gauge swatch and you'll have to stretch and pin your whole sweater in order to make it match your gauge. So just lay it flat, kind of smooth it with your hands let it dry completely. It may take a few days. You need to let it dry completely because sometimes as it dries, the stitches will kind of shrink a little or maybe they'll grow a little. Depends on the yarn, but you wanna let it dry completely. Then you're going to measure your gauge. I'm gonna do it with this one. It's too difficult to see the stitches on the dark one. So we're gonna do it on this one and I'm gonna zoom in Close, here we go. We're gonna measure these or count our gauge switches, count our gauge stitches on our gauge swatch. Take a ruler or a measuring tape and lay it across your swatch. You can see that I am not on the very edge. If I measure from the very edge, these stitches over here are gonna be a little bit distorted, so I'm gonna get a bad number. So I'm putting it in the inside. I'm avoiding my ribbing. Remember my ribbing at the bottom is messing up my bottom stitches. So I'm coming away from that so that I can have stitches that are not distorted. I like to use something sharp to count with. A knitting needle is perfect or you could use a pencil. I'm going to look at my swatch here and find where the column of stitches is. You can see here's a column of stitches. Here's a column of stitches and I'm gonna take the very edge of my measuring tape and I'm going to line it up right at the edge of those stitches and then I'm going to pin it down with my hand and I'm going to count. You can see here's a column of stitches and here's the section between the stitches so I'm going to put my pointy thing right in the center of that stitch. There's a little dimple there in the middle and that's where I'm going to set it in to count. So go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Now you can see I'm at eighteen, but here's nineteen, and my here's my four inch line and it's kind of in the middle of stitch number 19. So I have 18 and a half stitches. You want to make sure you count your half stitches too. 18 and a half stitches and I'll write that down. Usually when I am figuring out what my gauge is, I will take measurements at multiple different spots. In the swatch, I will move my tape measure around and I will count four or five different spots. And then I will average because you may be off by one or half a stitch. So I'll count my gauge, my stitches in my four inches over say four spots and then I will average that or choose the most common number. Say I get 18 and a half three times and 18 once, I'll go off of 18 and a half. Now we've counted our stitch gauge, we're gonna count our row gauge. I'm turning the swatch sideways. You can see the columns of stitches are running this way. I'm gonna take my tape measure and I'm gonna line it up perfectly along one of those columns. You can see my swatch isn't quite long enough. I should have knit another inch. But I'm going to, whoops, you can't see that. I'm going to line it up perfectly against one column of stitches. So you can see I'm lined up perfectly against this column of stitches. I'm gonna look over here where my beginning of my measuring tape is, and I'm gonna make sure it's the very top of the stitch. So here's a stitch here. You can see it's little legs there. I'm gonna make sure I'm at the very top of that stitch. And I'm gonna hold my measuring tape in place and I'm going to count. Now this is a woolen spun yarn so the stitches get a little bit blurry. I'm going to put my knitting needle, poke it down into that dimple and if I drag it down, not like super forcefully, but just gently drag it down, I can feel a little bump between each stitch. And as I come over that little bump, I can count my row gauge very accurately. So I'll go in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-
20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. One more, 28 and a half, I think is where we are at four inches. So I'm 28 and a half inches over, 28 and a half stitches over four inches for my row gauge. I'm gonna back up a little bit here. It is not super critical in this pattern. It is not super critical to meet this 36 rounds over four inches for your row gauge. In the pattern, everywhere where you need to knit something like the depth of the yoke or the length of the sleeves or the length of the body. I don't list it in number of rows. I list it by length. So you come over here, continue in stockinette by knitting every round until the yoke measures three and a half inches. I'm giving you the measurement. So if your row gauge does not match my row gauge, you can still knit this pattern just fine. You definitely want to match this stitch gauge. This one is super critical to meet. If you are off, then you are going to end up with a sweater that does not fit. You may have to gauge swatch again with a different size needle. So I have 24 stitches per inch. If you had more stitches per inch, say you had 28 stitches per inch, that means your stitches are too small and you need to knit with a larger size needle. So go grab a size six needle and do another gauge swatch and see if that gets you closer to 24. Or if you had fewer stitches than this 24 stitches, so you had 20 stitches, that means your stitches are too large and you need to use a smaller size needle. So go grab a size four needle and knit another gauge swatch. Gauge is a very, very individual thing. Everybody holds the yarn differently. Everybody tensions differently. Knitting is a very individual craft. Just because I used a size five doesn't mean you're gonna use a size five. You may use a different size knitting needle. That's why I have this little note here, or two whole sizes smaller than gauge needle. So if you have to go down a needle size and use a size four, then for your smaller size needle that you're gonna knit your ribbing with, you're gonna use two whole sizes smaller. These are two whole US sizes smaller. So if you switch this needle to a size four, you're going to need to go four minus two. That's a US size two needle that you're gonna use for your ribbing. Now on my Patterns, I have your skill level and skill required. This is also in the pattern description, so before you buy it, you can look at how difficult the pattern is and what exactly you need to do in the pattern. So all of the techniques are listed here. Then I also include a tutorial section in my pattern, so the different techniques that are used in the pattern will have a link to a tutorial for it if I've already made a tutorial for it. I haven't made all of the tutorials in the world but eventually we'll get there. So you can see I've got the German twisted cast on, which is the cast on we're using for this sweater is listed here. I will also include the link to the German twisted cast on in the description box below this video if you wanna go see that in more detail. Now we're done with the first page. We've knit our gauge swatch, we've got our gauge. We're gonna go through, take your pen, you're gonna look at, I'm making the three month size, but you can see We've got sets of parentheses. We've got five sizes within each set of parentheses. So you're gonna go through and you're gonna circle every single number that pertains to your size. If you look over here, there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers. And it's really easy to mistakenly move over one spot or another and grab the wrong number. So I want you to take your pattern and your pen and I want you to go through the entire pattern and circle the numbers that apply to your size that you are making. That way you don't accidentally snag the wrong number as you're working your way through the pattern. I'm circling all of the repeats, all of the stitch counts, everywhere there is a number. Oh, size three months gets to skip ahead to complete yoke. So in this, I have redacted all of the stitch counts for the other sizes. I really hope you can't read them through there. Um, 
The three month size isn't gonna work. All of the, the increase round four and five, those are for the larger sizes. So we're gonna skip over here to complete yoke. Then we have separate body and sleeves. We're gonna go through and circle all of the numbers. That way as I'm going through, I don't accidentally knit something wrong. The only difference between a new knitter and an experienced knitter is that the experienced knitter makes mistakes a lot faster. Oop, two and a half. Oh, that's centimeters. I circled both of them. There we go, I've got all of the numbers. Here's the schematic at the end. Don't need to circle the numbers on there if I don't want to. So I've got all of my numbers circled. I'm done with the first page. This is page two of the pattern. There will be a really nice cover photo and cover, which is page one. So this is page two. I just didn't print it because we don't need it. So we're done with the first page of the pattern, which is page two. Now here we have abbreviations. All of the abbreviations used in the pattern are going to be listed here. So you. If you find a little collection of letters somewhere in the pattern that you can't make sense of, check your abbreviation spot. So here's CO, the abbreviation CO. I can come up here to abbreviations. Oh, this is not in the right spot. It needs to be moved. Here is CO. It means cast on. This is listed alphabetically. As you can see, I've messed that up and need to go fix that. Here is the, where we start the pattern, knit seamlessly from the top down. It is telling you kind of an overview of the construction. Then I have these little headers that kind of direct you through the pattern. So begin at the top. We're gonna to read through the whole pattern and glance through the whole pattern and make sure we understand what's coming next. So we're gonna begin at the top with our cast on and we're gonna knit the ribbing here. Then we're gonna work an increase round. Then we're gonna work all of the short rows. Then when we're done with the short rows, we're gonna continue working increases through here. Then we're gonna complete the yoke, so we're gonna knit it to the length it should be. Then we're gonna separate the body and sleeves, which is this whole section here. We're gonna work the body, which we're just knitting to a length. We're gonna work ribbing at the hem. Then we're gonna come back and we're going to knit the sleeves here. And it gives you all of the instructions for the sleeves, the instructions for the cuff, and then the finishing instructions here at the end. We're gonna come back over here. Be sure to cast on loosely. You don't wanna cast on so loosely that it's sloppy, but you do wanna make sure that it's not gonna be too tight when you cast on for a top-down seamless sweater. This does have to go over your head. The German twisted cast on is a nice stretchy cast on. Remember there's a link in the description box below to a very detailed tutorial if you wanna see that. We're gonna come here with smaller size needles. So from page one, we have a size five and a size three. We're gonna use our size three with smaller size needle and using German twisted cast on, this needs to be capitalized. Cast on 60 stitches. So I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna move that to the side real quick. Here's my smaller size needle. It is a 40 inch circular needle, and it's okay that it's not the specified 32 inch, because I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna back this up a little bit. Nope, that's towards, that's as far out as it goes. Okay, I'm gonna pull off some length of yarn. When I am estimating how much yarn I need for my tail, for a long tail cast on, from my arm to my elbow, the length from my arm to my elbow is about 20 stitches, so 20, 40, 60. It may not be the same to you. You may have a slightly different um, number of stitches that goes from your hand to, to your elbow. That's how I estimate how many stitches. How long to make the tail for a long tail cast on. Okay, now remember there is a link to a more detailed tutorial down below, so I'm gonna be fairly quick. I've got my yarn in my left hand, my needle in my right hand, and I'm going to cast on. I start by just taking a little twist around the needle. There's my first stitch. Now I'm gonna begin casting on. If you don't know this cast on, please go watch the other tutorial because I really beat a dead horse in that one and it's very detailed. So I'm gonna cast on my 60 stitches. You can see 
that I am not getting super duper tight with these. I'm keeping it a little bit loose, but my stitches are still nice and neat. They're not loose and sloppy and flopping around. So I'm going to cast on 60 stitches and I want you to pause this video and cast on all of your stitches and then come back and we'll talk about the next step. I have my 60 stitches cast on and you can see that I definitely am not filling up this entire cord. You can also see that I overestimated how much of a tail I needed. It's not a perfect method, but I have way more than I need and it's gonna get in the way. So I'm just gonna break it off shorter. This does not wanna sit still for me. I want to keep about six inches roughly, which is 15 centimeters. So I'm just gonna break it here and get rid of Get rid of the extra piece, which would be a great addition to my waste yarn pile. So my tail is here, my working yarn is here. I've cast on all of my stitches and it is time to place the beginning of the round marker and join in the round. Now when you're knitting magic loop, you can end up losing your beginning of the round marker. It can fall off the end when you're on the side where your beginning of the round marker is. So you can take your beginning of the round marker and just slide it through the bottom of your cast on and just kind of hook it there. You can see I'm not through a stitch. I'm just kind of showing where the beginning of the round is, but I use the side that has my tail as my beginning of the round marker. Until I get further along, you are gonna need this once you get to the point where you have enough stitches to fill up your needle. So if you're gonna use the same method I do and use your yarn tail as your marker, then just keep this handy until later. Otherwise, just put your beginning of the round marker here in your very first stitch and get ready to join in the round. We're going to join in the round and use the magic loop method. So what we're going to do, you can look at your cast on. This is the top of your cast on stitches and the bottom has this little ridge, this little, it's kind of fatter at the bottom. You want to make sure not to twist your stitches as you're joining in the round. So you're gonna make sure you have this little ridge on the same side of the needle. You don't want it to be twisted around like this, where part of it is on top and part of it is on the bottom. That's gonna give you a problem. So I'm gonna split my stitches roughly in half. I'm gonna scooch them back away from the tip so that they're on the cord. If you have, if you're knitting a larger size, you're not gonna need to scooch them back because you have a lot more stitches. I'm going to bend my cable around so I can roughly pinch off half and I'm going to pull my cable through. You can see, I'm just gonna push two stitches apart and pull it through. All of it through, because this is a 40 inch needle, so I've got quite a bit of cable. Now I'm gonna push both sets of stitches onto my needles and I'm going to make sure the ridge at the bottom of my cast on is facing each other. So if I had this, where the ridge, so you can see the ridge is in the middle, the ridge is in the middle. If I had this twisted around this way, where the ridge was on the outside and then it kind of tucks under, I'm gonna have problems. So I need to make sure to have this little ridge at the bottom of my cast on on the inside. You can see I did not perfectly evenly split my stitches. That's okay, it's not a big deal. I'm gonna push everything up towards the end of the needle, particularly, so this is the end of the cast on. You can see I've got my yarn coming from this one. This one is further away from me, the other one is nearer to me because we're going to work into these stitches first. So I'm gonna push these to the end of the needle these ones don't have to be on the end of the needle. I just put them on the needle to make sure that I can get my cast on with the ridge in the middle. Now I'm going to take my both my working yarn and my tail and I'm gonna pull them over the top of the needle that's nearest me. I'm gonna work with both the tail and the working yarn together for the very first stitch. So I'm holding them, tensioning them, how I'm gonna hold my yarn when I work and I'm gonna work into the stitches that are on the close needle. I'm gonna grab the needle that's further away from me and I'm gonna pull it through and around. I don't have any stitches on this needle anymore. They're sitting on the cable in the back back here waiting to be worked. I'm gonna rotate my hand around. I'm ready to work into the stitches on the needle nearest me. I'm gonna knit the first stitch with both the working yarn and the yarn tail together. 
I'm gonna knit that first stitch. Now I'm gonna pull it really tight. Then I'm going to drop the tail. I don't need that anymore. I'm gonna drop the tail and I'm just gonna proceed with the working yarn. The working yarn is the yarn that's attached to your little yarn ball that you are knitting with. So I've knit the first one, now I'm gonna purl. And I'm gonna work knit one, purl one. You can see we've placed the beginning of the round marker, joined in the round. Round one is knit one, purl one. Let's talk about what these asterisks mean. We're gonna zoom in here. You can see round one, knit one, purl one, repeat from asterisk to asterisk to beginning of the round. So this section here, so asterisk to asterisk, is this whole bit in between these asterisks. We're gonna knit one, purl one, then we're gonna come back over here, knit one, purl one, come back over here, knit one, purl one. This is your repeat. You're gonna knit one, purl one until you reach the beginning of the round. I'm gonna back off, oop, wrong way. Back off, and now we're going to knit. We're not gonna knit, we're gonna work in ribbing all the way across the, all the way around the neckline. I'm going to do this with you, which might be kind of boring. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here we go, I'm gonna knit one, purl one, until I work all of the stitches on this needle that is in my left hand. And then I'm gonna show you how we work with the stitches that are on hold on the cable waiting in the back for us. This first round that you're knitting that is the cast on round, the stitches are sometimes a little bit tighter. It might be a little bit slow to work this first round as you work through the cast on stitches. Knit one, purl one. Whenever I am knitting in ribbing, I like to end on a purl stitch when I'm knitting magic loop style. So I've knit all of the stitches on my right hand needle, on my left hand needle, they're now all on my right hand needle and I need to come back and knit these stitches that are on the cord. So I'm gonna turn this around and I'm going to, here's my yarn tail, I'm gonna put it through I'm gonna move this so you can see this easier. I'm gonna put it through the neckline because when it's up here, I'm knitting this way. It's gonna get in the way, so I'm gonna, just gonna put it through my neckline and pull it down so it's out of the way. And I'm gonna pull my cable through. You see, I'm pulling it through to the left so that I can put these stitches off of the cord that are currently sitting on the cord onto my working needle. You see that they're nearer to me and the stitches that I've just worked are on the needle that's away from me. I'm gonna pull my working yarn around, I'm gonna grab the needle that's further away from me, and I'm gonna pull it through so that those stitches are now sitting on the cord waiting for their turn. And I'm going to knit the stitches that are now on my left hand needle, knit one, purl one. I'm going to continue in pattern, the knit one, purl one pattern, until I've reached the beginning of the round. So I'm gonna work across here. If you have a lot more stitches than me, you feel free to pause this video wherever you need to so that you can catch up to where I'm at. I'm just gonna knit across to the end. I feel very awkward doing this on video. Now I'm back at the beginning of the round. I've just knit the last stitch. I've just worked the last stitch. You can see it's a little bit loose here. Don't worry about that. We're gonna solve that in a minute. But I've got half the stitches on each. I'm back to the beginning. You can tell it's the beginning because here is my tail from my cast on, marking my beginning of the round for me. If you don't wanna use your yarn tail as your beginning of the round, you can 
put a stitch marker through there, but the reason I don't put a stitch marker on the needle is because if I've got a stitch marker on here, when I come around to this side and I'm at the beginning of the round, it's just gonna fall off my needle when I'm here. So I'm going to put these back on the cable and I'm going to adjust my stitches because I have a lot more on the back half than the front half. So I'm just gonna take two from the back and put them on the front because I do like to have perfectly even stitches. And that's a little more even. Now I'm going to work on this side. So it's near me, I'm pulling the cable through to put it back onto the working needle. The cable likes to get in the way sometimes. I've got my working yarn ready. I've got my needle ready to work. Oh, I'm gonna try to get this out of the way. Okay, now I've come around to the beginning and you can see that this is loose. You don't want it loose. Take your tail and snug it up. The reason that we knit that very first stitch with both the tail and the working yarn is so that you can just pull the tail and snug it up. As you keep working, it's gonna stay snug and when you come back to weave in this end and you weave it in nice and tightly, it will eliminate any gap that may have happened there. So we're gonna continue working in the round on our ribbing magic loop style, but the very, since this is the second round, remember I knit this very first stitch with both the working yarn and the tail. So I've got two loops over the needle here. You can see there's two loops, but that's one stitch. So I'm gonna knit through both of them. I'm gonna insert my needle through both of those loops and knit them like they're one stitch. And then I can snug this up again and that keeps my beginning of the round nice and tight. And now I'm gonna just continue working in ribbing until I have reached the length that I'm supposed to knit to. So you can see here, zoom in on my pattern again, continue in ribbing by repeating ribbing round. Oh, this is, this should be ribbing round. I'm finding changes I need to make to my pattern as I go through. So ribbing round, this should say ribbing round. Continue in ribbing by repeating ribbing round until ribbing measures one inch or two and a half centimeters. So you're gonna work in ribbing until you've gotten to one inch. Now I'm going to show you how to measure your ribbing. I'm gonna knit for a little while and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show you how to measure your ribbing. So keep knitting your ribbing until you have about an inch or if you're knitting one of the larger sizes, an inch and a half, and then come back and I'll show you how to measure your ribbing to make sure it's long enough. Your ribbing is done being knitted and it's time to measure it to see if we've got the proper length. Now, if this looks really tiny, do keep in mind that it stretches when it goes on. So when you have your ribbing on the needles, it's gonna squish all up. It's nice and squishy and all together, but when you actually put this sweater on, your ribbing is not gonna stay nice and squishy like this. It's going to open up a little bit. It's gonna stretch out a little bit. And when we stretch knitting width-wise, it's going to shrink lengthwise. So if you measure your ribbing with it all squished together, all nice like this, and it comes to one inch, and then we stretch it out, you might have less than one inch. So when you're measuring ribbing, take your tape measure, and put it on and then kind of gently stretch your ribbing. You don't need to like stretch it apart super fiercely like this. Just gently pull it open a little bit, stretch it out and then measure. And you can see I've got one inch here and I'm including, I'm including the stitches that are on the cable because these stitches are a round of ribbing. So I've got one inch of ribbing now. I've stretched it a little bit while I measure. I've got an inch of ribbing. And I'm going to now move on to my next thing. So here we go. Switch to larger size needles. You are not going to take all of your stitches that are on your size three needle and transfer them onto your size five needle. You are simply going to knit off of your size three needle and onto your size five needle. So switch to larger size needles. Now, there are going to be notes in italics. These are not part of the instructions, but it is very important information, so make sure you read it. This little note is telling you that not every size does every increase round, so you need to make sure your size is included before you work an increase round. So we're going to go down, next round is knit. So, whoop, wrong way. I'm going to 
have my stitches on my size three needle here. And I'm gonna take my size five needle. You see they're different sizes. Take my size five needle and I'm gonna have the size three, the smaller needles in my left hand, the larger needles in my right hand, and I'm simply going to knit. And by the time I finish this round, all of my stitches will be off of the smaller size needle and onto the larger size needle. If you are working on interchangeable needles, you can just unscrew the smaller size needle tip off of your cord, that, the one that you would hold in your right hand, and screw on the larger size. But I prefer to use fixed needles instead of circular needles. So that's, I just knit it onto the other one. I'm gonna work this whole round here, and then we're gonna move on to increase round number one, and we're gonna talk about that. So if you are knitting a larger size sweater, you may need to pause so that you can catch up to me before we get to increase round one. I recommend keeping your smaller size needle in your knitting bag so that it's handy. Maybe you go out somewhere and you get down to knitting the ribbing at the bottom of the hem or the cuffs. Just keep it in your knitting bag so it's right there when you need it. Almost there. The reason we knit the ribbing on a smaller size needle is to keep the ribbing from flaring or flopping or flipping. I'm done with size three, I'm gonna set it aside. I've got my knitting on size five. Here is my yarn tail marking my beginning of the round. I'm still knitting magic loop style. And now we're going to work increase round one. I'm gonna zoom in on it here. Increase round one all sizes. In the ones that don't, that all, not all of the sizes work, you can see it says size 32 on through 70 only. So this is all sizes work, increase round, oop, where are we at? Increase round one, all sizes. So we have knit two, make one left, repeat from star to star to beginning around, asterisk to asterisk to beginning of the round. So remember, inside of those asterisks is your repeat. Sometimes it may have you knit a few stitches before you begin the repeat and after you finish the repeat. But on this increase round, we're just knit two, making one left, all the way around to the beginning of the round. So I'm gonna show you how that works here. We're at the beginning of the round. I'm gonna go back a little other way a little bit. So maybe it's a little bit easier for you to see. So I'm at the beginning of the round. I knit two. Now I'm going to make one left. To make one left, you've identified the bar between the stitches. You can see it's right here, this bar between the stitches. And you're gonna take your left hand needle and you're gonna put it underneath that bar and you're gonna go from front to back. Now you see I have another loop on my needle. Now I'm gonna take my right hand needle and I'm going to knit into the back of that. So this is the front, oop, and then around over here, this is the back. So I'm going to insert my needle through the back of that. You can see I'm through the back of that, and I'm going to knit. Slide it off the needle. I've just made one left. Now I knit two, make one left again. I'm going to identify the bar between the stitches, insert my needle from front to back, knit into the back of that stitch. Knit two, Identify the bar, insert from front to back, knit into the back of that stitch. Knit two more, I'm gonna show you one more. Identify the bar between the stitches, insert your needle from front to back, knit into the back of that stitch. Normally when we knit, we would insert our needle this way. If you do that, you're going to end up with a hole. So for those of you you have problems with increasing where you are ending up with a hole. You can see the hole there, but you come back over here, 
There's no hole on that increase. There's no hole on that increase, but there's a hole on this increase. For those of you who are having a lot of trouble with holes when you increase, I think you might be knitting through the front instead of the back. So I'm gonna show you that one again. We are identifying the bar. We're inserting our needle from front to back and we're not knitting through the front. We're coming around to the back. Let me push the yarn around a little bit. So this is the front, and over here is the back. We're gonna knit, we're gonna insert the needle through the back. And we're gonna knit that. And now you can see the hole is gone. There is no more hole right there where I increased. Let's do it one more time just to be sure. Here's your bar between your stitches. Insert the left needle from front to back. Now we're going to knit into the back, not the front, into the back. And knit that stitch off the needle. There we go. Continue in this fashion around to the beginning of the round again and then hit play and we will talk about stitch counts. Okay, we've got our increase round done and we're gonna talk about stitch counts. You can see here, increase round one, 30 stitches increased, 90 stitches, but I highlighted over that. Oh, you can read the numbers. So you increased 30 stitches, and now you have 90 stitches. You're gonna count your stitches. It is very good practice to count your stitches every single time your stitch count changes. That way you know right away if you messed up your increases. So I'm gonna come through and I'm gonna count my stitches. I count by twos and I count in 10 stitch increments. Usually I'm counting hundreds of stitches. So if I lose my spot, I want to know which 10 I was on. So I'll go like this. Two, four, six, eight, 10. And then I'll move my thumb there. I'm at 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and I'll move my thumb there. 22, 24, 26, 28, but hey, if I lost track and I miscounted or a kid started to talk to me, I know my thumb is at 20, so I can start over from 20. 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, then I move my thumb. 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. So count your stitches all the way around. Make sure you have the right stitch count. The next, the next round is just knitting all the way around. So I want you to knit the next round and then we'll go into the short rows. And I want you to come back when you're ready to begin the short rows and we'll talk about short rows together. Let's begin by talking about why we do short rows. This is Blizzard that I'm showing you on. This is a sweater that's already finished. This is the front, this is the back. You can see that the back is higher than the front. If you take one of your regular crew neck t-shirts and you lay it flat, you'll notice also the front is gonna be lower than the back. That's because the front of our neck comes out from our body lower than the back of our neck. So we want to work short rows to raise the back of the neck so that it sits higher in the back but you also have it lower in the front so that your front neckline comes down low and gives space for the front of your neck. If you don't work these short rows, the neckline of your whole sweater is gonna sit high up on the front of your neck and it's gonna feel a little bit like it's strangling you, it's gonna be uncomfortable, it's gonna be touching your most sensitive part of your body, which is usually your neck. It's probably gonna be irritating and it's also gonna look really funky. So we're gonna work short rows to raise the back neck. Now the short rows can be worked in two different places. I'm gonna show you the back of this sweater. You see this little crescent of fabric here? This is where the short rows are worked. On Blizzard, the short rows are worked right after you work the neckline and before you work the color work. So the short rows can be right here, right after the neckline, or they can be, apologize for the wrinkles, this is my fletching, you can see there's no crescent of fabric here. The short rows in this sweater are worked down here underneath the color work. You can't really see because this is, this is too big to fit in the, in the frame, but the short rows are worked here underneath the color work at the bottom of the yoke. So depending on what pattern you're using, the short rows might be right after the neckline 
or they may be down at the bottom of the yoke. In wood smoke, the short rows are worked right after the neckline. If your sweater works them at the bottom of the yoke, you might have to move on past this point and come back to this. Now I'm gonna get my notebook and I'm going to demonstrate to you why we do short rows. Here's my to-do list for this week. Here is your yoke. I'm gonna do it this way, that feels funny. Here's your yoke. It's a circle, because it's a circular yoke. The beginning of the round is here. This is at the center of your back. So the beginning of the round is right here at the center of your back. So when you work your short rows, you're gonna work out to one shoulder, then back across the beginning of the round out to the other shoulder. So we're gonna start at the beginning of the round. We're gonna work out to the shoulder. We're gonna turn around, we're gonna come back, we're gonna go across the beginning of the round again, out to the other shoulder, stop, turn around and come back. And on each short row, we're gonna work a little bit less. So your short rows will gradually shorten as you work back and forth. This is a little bit lopsided. I am bad at drawing things until you've worked all of your short rows. Here are our instructions here. I'm gonna turn to my notes here because I wrote a lot of things down that I want to remember to tell you. Short rows. Short row one, this is your very first set up short row. You're starting on the right side of the sweater. You're gonna work on the right side and eventually on the wrong side. So on the right side, you're gonna knit 22, that you're knitting from the beginning of the round out to the shoulder. You're gonna knit 22 stitches. You're gonna turn your work around and now you're gonna be on the wrong side. Then you make a double stitch, which I'll show you how to do in a minute and then you'll purl to the beginning of the round, you'll slip the marker, then you'll purl 22 stitches. You see you've, you've got 22 stitches from the beginning of the round one way and 22 stitches from the beginning of the round the other way. So there, each turn starts 22 stitches away from the beginning of the round. So you're out of the shoulder in the same spot for this first turn. Then you turn your work. Then we're gonna come down here, short row two, you just turned your work so you're on the right side. And you begin by making your double stitch. You're gonna knit to four stitches before the last double stitch. I'm gonna show you how to identify your double stitch in a minute. Turn your work, now you're on the wrong side. You're gonna make a double stitch again and you're gonna purl to four stitches before your last double stitch. Then you're gonna turn the work. Notice in short row two, I do not mention the beginning of the round anywhere in this instruction. However, every time you knit across, both the right side and the wrong side, you're going to go past the beginning of the round marker. So you're gonna go past the beginning of the round marker once when you're working on the right side, and past the beginning of the round marker again when you're working on the wrong side. So inside of short row two, you're passing the beginning of the round marker twice. But you're not using the beginning of the round marker as a point from which to count from, because you're doing it to four stitches before your last double stitch. But I just want you to know that you're passing the beginning of the round marker as you go. Then you're going to repeat short row two, two or you know whatever number your size calls for. For my size, I'm knitting it two more times. Short row two includes two rows. You have one row on the right side, one row on the wrong side. So I've, uh, I'm gonna knit it once, and then I'm gonna knit it two more times. So I'm gonna repeat short row two a total of three times, which is gonna be six total rows, which will be in addition to short row one, which you have two rows in short row one. So I'm gonna have eight total rows added to the back of my sweater here. I'm gonna show you how to do this. Oh, wrong way. <clears throat> Someday I'll learn which way is zoom. Now see, I'm here at the beginning of the round. Here's my yarn tail from casting on that I'm using as my marker. But 
Now I'm going to take my beginning of the round marker, this way you can keep your marker handy, I'm going to put it on. I'm going to change the orientation of my stitches. I'm going to be working on the stitches that are in the back half of the sweater and I'm not going to be working at all with the stitches on the front half of the sweater. So I'm going to change the setup of the stitches on my needle so that I'm only working on the back half. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to roughly estimate half of the stitches with slightly more on the back, which is over here by my needles, versus the front. So I'm just going to pull my cable out on this side and again on this side. And I lost my marker. That's not quite enough. I'm going to move my cable a little bit more. So I've got, these are my back half. This is my front half. I'm going to grab my marker because it fell off in the middle of that. I've got my marker on there. I'm at the beginning of the round and I'm ready to begin short row one, which says knit 22 stitches. So we're going to knit 22 stitches. Remember, if I'm going too fast, you are free to pause this video and catch up. So I've knit 22 stitches. If you're knitting a larger size, you'll have more stitches. I've got a few extra over here. Now I'm going to turn my work. So it's facing me and I turn it around. Now I'm going to be working across the wrong side of the fabric. Make double stitch. To make a double stitch, we're going to zoom in so you can see this in great detail to make a double stitch, you're going to have the working yarn towards you. So I'm not gonna have it back here in the back, I'm gonna have it in the front. The working yarn is in the front. The wrong side of the fabric is in the front. So with the working yarn in the front, I'm going to slip the first stitch on my left hand needle onto my right hand needle. Now this is the very last stitch that you knit as you were knitting your 22 stitches or whatever number of stitches you needed to knit. So I'm going to slip that stitch. I'm going to slip it purl wise. So I'm going to insert the needle in the front. I'm not changing the orientation of the stitch. Like if I slipped it knit wise like this, I would twist the stitch. You're sl slipping it purl wise, so you're inserting the needle as if to purl, so you don't change the orientation of the switch. stitch. Slip it onto your right hand needle. Now you take your working yarn that is towards you, you pull it up over the top of the needle and around to the back of the work. And you can see as I do that, there's only one leg there, and as I pull it over the top, I have two legs. That, sticking up over my needle. This is a double stitch. It's called a double stitch because you've got the two legs showing there. Now I hold my yarn. I've come around over the top of the needle and now I need to purl. So I bring my yarn back to the front so it's in the proper position to purl. And I hold this snug. You don't want to pull this furiously tight but you want to hold it a little bit tight, nice and snug. And now we're going to purl. And we're going to purl back to the beginning of the round. We just go until we hit the beginning of the round marker. Now I'm at my beginning of the round marker. I slip it from my left hand needle onto my right hand needle and now I need to purl 22 more stitches.
That's 22. Your beginning of the round marker needs to stay there. It's very important that you keep track of where your beginning of the round is. If you don't know where your beginning of the round is, you'll probably put the sleeves in the wrong place and your whole sweater will be crooked. So make sure you keep the beginning of the round marker here and as you work past it each time, just slip it from your left hand needle onto your right hand needle. So I've purled my 22 stitches and now the next instruction, turn work. That's the completion of short row number one. Now we're coming on to short row number two. We're on the right side of the fabric. The first instruction is to make a double stitch. So we take our working yarn, we pull it to the front. Then we take the first stitch on your left hand needle and we slip it onto the right hand needle purl wise, just like before. And then we take our working yarn and we pull it up over the top of the needle and around the back and we pull it snug. And on this side, it kind of, on the knit side, it's a little bit funky. So I like to push the stitch over to make sure that the, the legs of the stitch are not twisted over on themselves. I like to make sure they're not crossed. So I pull them around and my yarn is in the back and I'm knitting. So I need to have my working yarn in the back when I knit. So I've pulled my yarn. Here we go, I'll do it again. I'm gonna pull my yarn over the top to the back. I'm gonna make sure I'm not crossing my double stitch. Here is my double stitch right here. And now I'm going to knit. And I make sure to hold it snug while I knit that first stitch. And then I'm going to knit to four stitches before the last double stitch. So we're gonna just knit across. You can count. So 22 minus four is gonna be 18 stitches that you will need to knit to. But I'm going to show you how to identify your double stitch so that you don't have to keep track of how many stitches to knit from the beginning of the round. And you can just knit until you see your double stitch and then go four stitches in front of that. So we're knitting, knitting, knitting out here to the end. You can also mark your double stitch with like a locking stitch marker. Now here's my double stitch. I'm two stitches too far, so I'm gonna go back two stitches. Here is my double stitch. You can see, uh, I'll hold this differently so you can see it better. Normal knit stitch, normal, uh, that's my, my thumb is too fat, here we go. Normal knit stitch, normal knit stitch, normal knit stitch, normal knit stitch. This is your double stitch. After the double stitch, you will usually have a little gap here. So that's a good giveaway. And you can also see the double legs of it. If I can spread it out a little bit, you can see the double legs of my double stitch sitting nice and close together. So that's my double stitch and I wanna be four stitches in front of it. So here's my double stitch. One, two, three, four. This is where I make my short road turn. So I turn my work. Now I'm working on the wrong side. I have my working yarn in the front. I slip the first stitch on my left hand needle onto my right hand needle, purl wise. Then I take my working yarn up over the top of my right hand needle, pulling that stitch over, the slipped stitch over, so we have double legs showing. Then I'm gonna bring my working yarn around underneath my right hand needle so that it's in the front so that I can purl. And now I'm gonna purl back the other way and I need to purl to four stitches before the last double stitch. So we're gonna purl across to four stitches before the last double stitch. Here's my beginning of the round marker, I just slip it. Okay, here we are. You can see the little gap right here. 
maybe I'll put it closer. You can see the little gap right here. You can see the double stitch right here pulled over top of the needle. You can see the two legs of it. And we have one, two, three, four. We're four stitches before the double stitch. So now I'm going to turn my work. And that is the completion of one repeat of short row two. So we're going to do short row two, two more times from here. I'm going to work through short row two once more with you. And then I'm going to turn you loose to finish your short rows. And then I'll show you how I like to count them. So here I have my yarn in this in the front. I slip the first stitch on my left hand needle onto my right hand needle, purl wise. I pull my working yarn over the top of my right hand needle and back around and down. And then I knit that first stitch tightly. And now I'm going to knit across until four stitches before my last double stitch. Every time you repeat short row two, it will get a little bit closer because each time you work short, your double stitches a little bit closer to your beginning of the round. So it will get a little bit quicker as you move through your short rows. Where, oh, here we are. I went a little bit too far. You can see I've got my little gap here. I've got my double stitch here and I've got one, two stitches, but I needed to be four stitches before my double stitch. So I need to tink back two stitches. Tink is knit spelled backwards. So you can see I've got my stitch on the needle and I've got the stitch right underneath it. So I insert my left hand needle into the stitch underneath the stitch on my right hand needle and I just pull that stitch off of my right hand needle, insert it into the stitch below, pop that stitch off. Now I'm four stitches before my double stitch, which you can identify right here, the little gap on the left hand side of it, and you can see the two legs of it. I'm gonna turn my work. Now I'm working on the wrong side. I'm gonna work a double stitch. So I'm going to slip the first needle on my left hand needle onto my right hand needle purl wise. Then I'm going to take my working yarn over the top of the right hand needle and around underneath so that I can bring it to the front again so I can purl. And then I'm going to purl that first stitch tightly. And now I purl to four stitches before the last double. Okay, you have finished all of your short rows here, finished your repeats of short row two. Ordinarily, you can mark off your short rows with little tally marks is when you make a little line straight up and down and you can make a line for each repeat. And then once you get four, you cross them off. That's what we call tally marks here in the United States. But I'm gonna show you a way to count your double stitches so that you don't have to put down your knitting and pick up your pin and mark off a row. So we're going to see how many, how many double stitches we need so that we know how many double stitches we need to count. So we're gonna go here, repeat short row two, two more times for my size, but write whatever number is for your size. So I'm gonna write a two right here. Now short row two, you work two double stitches in short row two, one per side. We're only going to count the double stitches on one side. So we're just gonna put a one here. We work one per side. Then short row one, you also work two double stitches in short row one, but you only work one per side. So we're going to put one. And now we're gonna add these all up. 1 plus 1 plus 2, or however many times you need to repeat it. Then we have four double stitches. I'm going to write DS for double stitch. We need four double stitches. Now keep in mind that your final double stitch is down here in next round. Make double stitch. That's your final double stitch. So after you've worked your repeat of short row two, you work the wrong side and you turn the work 
So you're on the right side now. We're on the right side of the fabric. We're gonna work our last double stitch right here on the right hand side of the beginning of the round marker. So we'll only have three double stitches on this side already because we need to work the fourth one yet. We need four right. So we count the double stitches on the left hand side of the beginning of the round marker. I'm gonna spread the stitches out a little bit so I'm gonna back up a little bit first. There we go. I'm gonna spread the stitches out a little bit because when I do that, that makes that little gap on the left-hand side of the double stitch, it makes that stand out. So I've got one. You can see here's the little gap. Here's the two legs of the double stitch right there. So I've got one, two, three, and Four. I've got four double stitches on the left hand side of my sweater. Now remember you're counting on the left hand side with the right side facing you. So now I need to work. I'm coming around next round, make double stitch, knit to beginning of the round. So I'm going to make my very last double stitch here. I'm going to move my phone. I've been getting texts and I don't know if you can hear the vibration or not. So I'm gonna make my last double stitch. Slip the first stitch on your left hand needle onto your right hand needle. Pull your working yarn over the top of the right hand needle and around and we're going to knit to the beginning of the round. Here we are, we're at the beginning of the round. You can see the short rows have created more fabric here in the center back than there is out at the shoulders. That's what your short rows do. They create more fabric in the back of the sweater. So we're at our beginning of the round. Now we need to turn this page and we're up here. Next round, Ooh, it's not quite focused. There we go. Knit to the beginning of the round, knitting the two legs of each double stitch together as you go. So this is how we resolve the double stitch. Oop, I pulled my marker off. On this round, we're going to resolve all of the double stitches on one round. If you have worked a pattern where they make you move past your short row before you make the next turn, then you will have already resolved all of your double stitches. But this, on this round, we're gonna resolve them all and I'm gonna show you how to do that. So here's my beginning of the round, and I'm going to begin knitting. I'm going to slip my beginning of the round marker, and I'm going to knit to my first double stitch, wherever that is. Pause this video if you're not there yet, and start over again when you've reached your double stitch. Here's my double stitch. You can see the two legs. You can see the little gap on the left-hand side of it. Now these two legs, we're going to knit them together. Pull this down. So we're going to take our right hand needle and we're going to insert it knitwise through both of those legs. And we're going to knit them together. And you've just resolved your first double stitch. Now we're going to knit to the next one. We're to our next double stitch. We're going to knit both of those legs together. If you were to knit the legs singly, you would have a weird gap over here. It wouldn't look right, plus you'd have added a stitch. So we're Inserting our needle through both. I'm going to show you lip focus. I'm inserting my needle through both of those legs and I'm knitting them together. Go to my next double stitch. And I'm knitting both of those legs together. And continue to my last double stitch on this side. And I'm knitting them together. Now I'm off, I've worked all the stitches on my left hand needle. I'm gonna switch this around. What I'm going to do at this point, since I'm done working all of my short rows, I want to go back to having my beginning of the round over here, having my needle sit at the beginning of the round over there. So I'm just gonna pull my cord through. This is the beginning of the round. I pulled my a loop through right at the beginning of the round. I'm leaving my marker on there. It's not gonna fall off because my needles aren't there and I'm going to come around and magic loop style, I'm going to knit the other half. Where am I going? 
Nope. I've got to pull my needle around this way. I've lost track of where I'm at. Push that one in, pull this one out. Now I've got to finish working all of these stitches and we're going to resolve all of the double stitches on that side as we go. So I'm going to knit until I find my very first one. Nearly there. Now when we're coming from this side, it looks a little bit different. There's not going to be any gap on the left hand side. The gap needs to sit on this side of the stitch. The gap sits on this side of the stitch. So there's not going to be a gap, which you can use to identify the double stitch with anymore, but you can see Here's a normal knit stitch, here's a normal knit stitch, here's a normal knit stitch, and you can see this over here has two legs coming up over the needle. You can see the two legs there? That is your double stitch. And we're going to knit both of those legs together. This side is a little bit tighter. There we go. Insert through both legs. We've got both legs. We're through both legs. Knit them together. Then continue knitting until you reach your next double stitch. Here's your next double stitch. There's no gap on the left side anymore because the gap would have been on the right side for these ones. But you can see we've got two legs here coming over the needle. So we're going to knit those two together. Knit till our next one. Here's our next double stitch. You can see the two legs here. We're going to knit them both together. And off we go to the next one. Knit both legs together and I'm going to knit to the beginning of the round. If you're not to the beginning of the round yet, go ahead and pause and then hit play again when you're back to the beginning of the round. Here we are. This is the beginning of the round over here. And you can see that I've got more fabric here in the back than I do in the front. So when you're wearing this sweater, I'm going to back up a little bit. When, you're, when the child is wearing the sweater or when you are wearing the sweater, we're going to match up the cable to the cable here, at the bottom. You can see the front of the neckline is lower than the back of the neckline and that gives you a comfortable fit and it also looks right when you're wearing it. So here I am at the beginning of the round. Now at this point I'm going to split my stitches again so that I have half and half. I'm just going to fold my cable against itself and work my way over here. It doesn't need to be perfectly in the middle. And when I get over here I'm going to pinch it and pull through a loop. And there I go, I've got half on one side, half on the other. Since I am now getting further away from my tail for my cast on that I use as my beginning of the round marker when I first start, I'm going to take my beginning of the round marker and I'm going to, I'm not going to put it on the needle itself, but I'm going to put it over here. I'm just going to, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see exactly what I'm doing. I'm just going to come through the stitches over here. I'm just going to insert it into the fabric. So you can see it's right here at the beginning of the round. This column of stitches goes to that needle. This column of stitches goes to this needle. And I've got my beginning of the round marker through one leg of each stitch. So right here, this right here at the very center here between these two legs that are on my beginning of the round marker, right between there, that's my beginning of the round. 
and I'm going to just leave it on there. As I work and I add depth to my yoke, I'll move that on up. And now I'm going to work the rest of my yoke. So we can come here, uh, let's zoom back in. Continue upper yoke, all sizes knit, six rounds or however many rounds. So you're gonna knit that many rounds and use a tally mark to mark off each round as you go. So you can mark them off just with little marks. And then you're gonna work increase round two. This is just like increase round one that we did a little bit ago. All sizes, knit three, make one left. And don't forget that you can count your total stitch count. And we're gonna have that where you knit some rounds, just plain stockinette, then you're gonna work an increased round. When you come down here after increase round three, that's the last increase round that all sizes are gonna work. Now you can see that sizes three months through 12 years skips ahead to complete yoke. You can see how this is bolded and in italics. This is a heading. So we jump over here, here's the same heading, complete yoke. So if you're making sizes three months through 12 years, you don't knit this bit here. You just skip ahead to complete yoke and then you read the instruction there. So continue in stockinette by knitting every round until the yoke measures three and a half inches. So at this point, I'm going to work the increase rounds until I'm complete. Then I'm gonna jump over here and I'm just gonna knit in the round until my yoke is three and a half inches deep. Now you measure that straight down at the center front, including the neckline ribbing. So remember, our back yoke has more fabric in it. So when you're measuring the depth of your yoke, you want to measure exactly opposite of where this beginning of the round marker is. So I'll just kind of pinch it together. So it's like this. Here's my beginning of the round marker kind of peeking out the back. So I know this is the center front here. It's directly opposite the center back. And I'll measure that from, hang on, the very edge of the ribbing, down, straight down. Now I want you to continue with these increases. So continue the upper yoke. You're gonna work through the increases and you're going to come around to complete yoke and you're gonna work until it is the depth the pattern specifies. So whatever depth you have in here, you're gonna to work to that depth. And then I want you to come back and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about completing the yoke, about exactly how to measure, to make sure you have the right measurement on the yoke, because that is also very important. And then we'll talk about separating the body of the sleeves. So I'm gonna let you go, but not before, hang on, don't go yet. I don't wanna turn you loose until I show you how to start a new ball of yarn, but also, okay. Are we all the way out? Are we all the way out? You're knitting magic loop. But eventually, if you're knitting one of the larger sizes, eventually you'll get enough stitches where you fill up your cable. So this is the sweater I'm knitting on right now. You can see the cable is full of stitches. But if you were knitting and you're not quite full of stitches, but you have too many stitches to really have them separated half and half, you're gonna come over here, right behind your right hand needle. You're gonna come over here, give yourself a little inch so you have a little room for things to flex and play how they need to. And you're just gonna pull up a loop over here. You're gonna pull up a loop and then you're gonna knit. And as you knit, this loop will come around closer and closer and closer to your left hand needle. And when it gets about over here, an inch or two away from your left hand needle, you come around over here behind your right hand needle and you pull this loop up again. That way, if you have too many stitches to equally divide them half and half, magic loop style like you are here, then you can still keep working comfortably with your circular needle without needing to grab a different length. You just pull the excess cable out over here behind your right hand needle. Now, I'm also going to show you how to join a new ball of yarn before you go. So I'm going to knit just a few stitches here. Now I'm 
gonna join a new ball of yarn. So when you're working to the end of a ball of yarn, you want to leave about hmm, six inches or so. I'm gonna just go ahead and break my yarn here. You want to leave about six inches, so you, uh, when you're about six inches from the very end, you grab your new ball of yarn. Here's your new yarn. And you're going to have, so here's the ball. You're gonna have the ball, the yarn that's coming from the ball of yarn over to the left, and the tail is over to the right. And your old piece, the piece that you're using up, is gonna be coming out to the left. The end is over towards the left. You're gonna lay your two yarns over top of each other, so your old ball of yarn with your new ball of yarn. You're gonna hold them together, and you're gonna have your new ball of yarn have a yarn tail about six inches long over to the right. So this is your yarn tail over to the right from the new yarn over to the right. And here is, oh, I gotta grab it again. Your old, your new, you're gonna hold them together. You can see I've got them together. You're gonna to knit two stitches holding both together. Now you're gonna take your tail from your new ball of yarn, stuff it down inside your yoke so it's out of the way. You're going to drop your old ball of yarn and stuff that end down inside your yoke so it's out of the way. Get rid of that one. And now you're left with just your new ball of yarn and you're just gonna keep knitting like normal. Now you have See this, normal, 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 all the way. Then these two stitches have two strands each. When you come back around and you knit this part, you're gonna knit both of those strands together. So I'm gonna quickly knit around and I'm gonna show you how to knit them together. And I'm gonna make you watch me knit. So you can knit alongside me if you're still knitting. It is raining here today. Definitely not summer anymore. It's raining and it's gonna be cool from here on out. So this is the perfect time of year to start knitting sweaters upon sweaters. I usually just knit sweaters all of the time. I'm a massive sweater knitter. I'm just trying to make you all into sweater knitters too. No, I dropped a stitch. Oh, hey, there's a wonderful opportunity to tell you how to drop, pick your stitches back up. So I dropped this one. When you pick it back up, make sure you have the right leg in front, otherwise your stitch will be twisted. Just slide it back on the needle and keep going. We're almost to the end here. Okay, here we go, beginning of the round. We're almost there. It's kind of in my way. Okay, here we are. This is where I joined my new ball of yarn. You can see there's two strands of yarn for each of these stitches, so we're just going to knit both of them together like they are one stitch. And at the other one, both of them together like they're one stitch. Now, this might end up being a little bit loose when you first knit it, so you can just grab your two tails that are coming out the back and just tug them snug, and that will make this nice and snug. And then you won't be able to tell where they were. Okay, now I want you to work through continue upper yoke in all of the increases and come around to complete the yoke and knit to 
the length specified. I'm gonna do that as well. And when I have knit far enough, I will come back. I will show you again how to measure the depth of your yoke. And then we will move on to separate body and sleeves together. Okay, here we are. We've got our yoke done. So my yoke needs to measure three and a half inches. You see I've spread it all out on the needle so that it lays flat. When you're measuring your yoke depth, you need to make sure that it's not all bunched up. If I bunch it all up on the needles like this and it's all rumpled, it's going to be very difficult to get an accurate measurement. You need to spread it out and lay it flat so it lays nice and smooth. Then we're going to measure down the center front. So here's my beginning of the round over here. Directly opposite of that is my center front. So I'm measuring straight down at the center front, including the neckline ribbing. This is the neckline ribbing. So basically we're going from the cast on edge all the way down out here to my cable. So I'm gonna lay my needle, or not my needle, my measuring tape here on the ribbing, and I'm gonna measure straight down. I'm gonna make sure it's spread nicely. So, because if it's bunched up, it's gonna be longer than it should be. So I'm gonna make sure it's spread nicely. I'm not gonna stretch it furiously, but I'm gonna smooth it out so that it's laying as it ought to. Here we go, down to the bottom three and a half inches. I'm a tiny bit over three and a half inches, but that's okay. I maybe knit one round too far, but that's good. So I'm at three and a half inches. It is now time to separate body and sleeves. That's the section right here. I'm gonna zoom in on this, ooh, so you can read it. So I'm gonna knit 23. This is from, the, we're starting at the beginning of the round. Knit 23, place the next 30 stitches on waist yarn for the sleeve. Using backwards loop, cast on six stitches in underarm, knit across 45 stitches. Place the next 30 stitches on waist yarn for the next sleeve. Using backward loop, cast on, cast on six stitches in the underarm, knit to the beginning of the round. Then I should have 102 stitches. Oop, wrong direction. So here we are at the beginning of the round, and I am going to knit 23 stitches. But I know I'm gonna need waist yarn when I get there. I'll just knit the first 23. So remember when I gave you the little tip? So this is too many stitches for magic loop. As you can see, if I split them in half, it's just kind of not quite, not enough. I can't pull this needle out and knit magic loop style. So what I do at this point is I just pull out a loop. This is my right hand needle here. I just pull out a loop behind my, where are we going? Behind my right hand needle. And I'm just knitting round and round and round, round. And the extra cord is over here. So I'm going to knit 23 stitches. Do keep in mind that if I'm going too fast, pause the video until you catch up because I am knitting a teeny tiny little sweater. Yours is probably going to be bigger than this. I lost count, two, four, six. I'm gonna double check that I've gone the right number of stitches. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, three. So now I need to place, this is the beginning of the round, so I've knit half the back. Now I need to place the sleeve stitches on hold. So I'm going to take my other ball of yarn. You can use yarn from a different project you know, just little leftovers, or you can just use yarn from your other ball of yarn. You want to get a long enough piece that you're gonna be able to go all the way around. I'm gonna show you on this sweater. This is the armhole. We're too close, let's get further away. You can go all the way around your armhole and have some leftovers so that your waist yarn is not going to fall out of your like get pulled out of these stitches that it's keeping on hold. You want to you don't want to have it all you don't want to have it all bunched up like this because if you have all your stitches bunched up, you can't actually try your sweater on. So you want your stitches to be able to spread out and lay like they will when this fabric is done with some extra so that 
this waste yarn doesn't get pulled out of your stitches. So I'm gonna do, oh, this is probably eight inches or so. And I'm gonna put it onto my tapestry needle. Now when you're doing yarn and you're gonna put it onto a tapestry needle, if you just take the end of your yarn and you try to put it through the eye of your needle, it's not gonna work well because your yarn is all fuzzy at the end. Is it gonna focus? No. Your yarn is all fuzzy at the end. All of those individual plies, it does not wanna focus on my yarn, I'm sorry. All of these individual plies, oh, you can see it now. See, that's all fuzzy and fluffy. And even if you get it wet and smooth it down, it's not gonna to wanna to go through that little tiny eye very nicely. So I never just put the end of the yarn through the eye. This is what I do. I come a little bit in, just barely away from the edge. I hold it pinched between my fingers on each side, about an inch apart, and I twist it with my right hand, ooh, and my left hand. I twist it, so I'm twisting it hard, and then I make a little loop I've made a little loop of the tightly twisted yarn. Now I have that loop and I put that little loop through my needle, but I also use my thumbnail to shove it through. And you can see it's coming up there. And then I grab it with my right hand and I pull it through. Then I don't end up with the end of my yarn splitting and getting all weird. So here's my waist yarn is on my tapestry needle and I need to put 30 stitches on waist yarn. Let me zoom in, here we go. When you put these stitches onto your waist yarn, you want to make sure not to twist them. Remember, if you slip things knit wise like this, it's gonna end up being twisted. So you're going to put your tapestry needle straight in alongside your knitting needle. You can see it's coming in straight underneath my knitting needle. So I'm coming straight in underneath. I generally take them off two at a time. It also makes it a lot easier to count like that. I'm gonna move my stitches around, take them off. And I'm not counting as I go, so I'm gonna have to count in a minute. I just slide my tapestry needle underneath my knitting needle through those stitches slide them off the left hand needle onto my waist yarn. You can see they're moving onto the waist yarn here. I should probably count. How many do I have? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. I need 10 more. This should be 30, but I'm going to count again just to be sure. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. So I've got 30 stitches on waist yarn. I'm gonna pull the end out here. Set my tapestry needle aside. So you can see I've got 30 stitches on waist yarn. I've got enough waist yarn that they can all lie nice and smooth on the waist yarn and I have extra so that it doesn't get pulled out. If you are super worried about your waist yarn getting pulled out of your stitches, you can just come over here to the end and tie it into a little knot. I generally don't because I generally use yarn that isn't slippery, so it tends to just stay in place. But you can do this if you're worried about it falling out. Now we've put all of the sleeve stitches on hold. It is time to cast on with backwards loop six stitches for the underarm. I generally push the sleeve to the inside. So you can see this is the inside. I push it in there just to keep it out of the way. If I bring it out here, it's kind of in front of me and it can be in the way and I can't see past it. So I generally just push it back this way and when you come back around, you can pop it back out. It's fine. It's not going to mess anything up if it's in there. So I'm ready to work. I'm holding my working yarn in my left hand, and I'm ready to cast on with backwards loop six stitches. To cast on with backwards loop, I bring my left index finger forward and rotate my left hand around, 
and that twists the working yarn and then I just slide my right hand needle under that loop that's on my finger. Then I pull my finger out and I pull it tight. There I've cast on with one backwards loop. Basically what you're doing is you're taking your working yarn, you're making a twist in it so that it is twisted around on itself. Do you see how it comes around with the working yarn coming behind? That way, when you tighten that down, it makes a loop that stays in place. So how I do it is I hold my working yarn like I am knitting, and then I just bring my finger in and rotate my whole hand around and slip it onto my right hand needle and pull it tight. It's a really quick motion. So there's six stitches here. You can see here's the last stitch from my back and we can count one, two, three, four, five, six stitches cast on with backwards loop. This is the underarm. This is the part that goes under your armpit. And now we need to knit across 45 stitches. This is the front of the sweater that we're knitting across here. So we're gonna knit across 45 stitches. Now I'm going to count to make sure. I always count and double count when I'm separating for sleeves to make sure that I have the right stitch divide. So I'm not gonna count the six that I cast on with backwards loop, but I'm gonna knit the 45 across the front. To, or not knit, count the 45 across the front. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 45. So I've knit my 45 stitches. You can see my loop, my extra cable loop is over here right by my left hand needle. I don't wanna have it here. So I'm gonna come around behind my right hand needle and pull up a loop so that loop is off to the other side and out of my way. Now it is time to put the next 30 stitches on hold for the second sleeve. So I'm taking another piece of waist yarn, same length as the first one. Again, I'm twisting it between my fingers, pinching up a little loop of nicely tightly twisted yarn. Then I'm going to push that little loop through the eye of my tapestry needle and I'm gonna use my thumbnail to shove it through, pinch it on the other side, pull it through. Now I'm ready to do another 30 stitches. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty two. 24, come on, 26, 28, 30. Now I'm gonna double check that I've got the right number. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. There's another 30 stitches. I'm done with my tapestry needle for now. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it away. And now we're going to cast on with backwards loop, six stitches in the underarm again. So 
So I'm tucking the sleeve forward, the, the sleeve stitches forward to the inside so they're out of my way. I've got my needles side by side so I can easily cast on six stitches. Bringing my finger forward, rotating my wrist around one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm going to double check. Two, four, six. Okay, now at the very end, it says knit to the beginning of the round. That's going to be the second half of your back. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty two. Oh no. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. So the second half of my back is going to be the same as the first half of my back, which is 23 stitches. But I only have 22 stitches. Oh dear. See, I told you experienced knitters only make mistakes faster. Um. Oh no. I need to have 22 because I'm working with an odd number of stitches for each half. So the knit across 45, here we go. Nope, wrong way. Knit across 45. I have 45 stitches for the front, which means I have 90 stitches for both the front and the back. But you can't take 45 and divide it by two evenly. So you're gonna have 23 for the first half of the back and 22 for the second half of the back because 45 doesn't divide perfectly by two. So I'm okay. And it's okay to be one stitch to the side of the beginning of the round. That's totally fine. You have 45 for the front and 45 for the back, so it will be just fine. Now, I am going to knit to the beginning of the round, and then I'm going to set my stitches up differently because now that I have removed my sleeve stitches, I have a lot fewer stitches on my needle. Actually, this is really annoying. I'm gonna change how I do it now. So, no, nope, wrong way. We're gonna go all the way out. You can see they're kind of spread out way, they're stretched out way too much over here. There isn't enough stitches to go like this anymore where you just pull out one loop. I need to go back to half of the stitches on one side and half on the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to line these stitches up and I'm going to work my way around until I'm halfway and I'm going to pinch my cable and I'm going to pull it through. So now I'm going to work magic loop style, half sitting on the cable in the back and half on the front. That way I don't have my stitches spread out too far. Okay, here we go. We're going to keep knitting and I'm going to show you how to work those cast on stitches. They can be a little bit tight and finicky to work with. So let's get around over to the underarm and I'll show you how to deal with those ones. All right, here we are to the underarm. One more. Let's get zoomed in closer. When you come around and you're going to knit your six stitches that you cast on with the backwards loop, or however many you cast on, the very first time you come around to do it, you're going to have this really long, loose strand. Don't worry about that. We're just going to knit this first stitch. You need to be very careful not to knock these new stitches off of your left hand needle as you're knitting them because then it's a pain to get them back again. So we're just going to gently and carefully knit that. And you notice after I knit the first one, that really long strand got moved over and it's still here. Oh, better make sure I don't knock that one off the front. Don't mind this fly. He's annoying me, but I hope he doesn't annoy you. And we're just 
there's my long strand again. As you work along here, that long extra bit will get distributed between these six stitches and it will go away. Oh, I almost lost this stitch. And here's the last one. And then you see that long strand, it's much shorter now. I'm gonna knit and I'm gonna pull it very tightly. My first stitch after those backwards loop casted on ones. And then I'm gonna keep working around. A lot of people have a question about how to prevent holes in the underarm when you come back to pick up the sleeves is when we deal with the hole in the underarm issue. So there's nothing you need to worry about right now about the holes in the underarms. Now we're gonna knit the body. So let's get back, let's get our pattern back. Here we go. Continue in stockinette until body measures four and a half inches. So continue in stockinette means that you just keep knitting every single round. You just go round and round and round and you knit constantly until the body measures four and a half inches. And you're gonna measure that from the underarm. So from right here, where you have these stitches in the underarm, you're gonna measure from there down. But there's something we need to do before you finish knitting the body. I want you to knit an inch or two inches of your sweater, and then I want you to come back to this video and I'm gonna show you how to try your sweater on as you go. Because one of the main advantages of knitting a top-down seamless yoke sweater is that you can try it on as you go. So go to knit an inch or two, you need to knit an inch or two. So pause it, knit an inch or two of your body, and then come back and I'll show you how to do this. This sweater is my current whip. It's gonna be called Bow, B-O-U-G-H, like a tree bow. And you can see I've split for the sleeves here, and I'm down and I'm working on the body. So now I want to try the sweater on. You've probably only knit an inch or two. I tried this on a few inches ago, but we're just gonna show you with this one because I can't demonstrate it on a three month size sweater. So here we go. I've come around, you see I'm in the underarm here. I've knit to the center of the underarm. It doesn't matter on which side, just knit to the center of the underarm. And now I'm gonna take a second needle. This is the same size needle. This is a US size six needle, circular needle. This is. 32 inch US size six circular needle. This is a second US size six circular needle. And I'm going to knit half of the stitches onto this second needle. You can see how everything is nice and tight and bunched up. Well, not super bunched up, but it's nice and close. It's good for knitting with. But if I tried to put this sweater on, there's no way I could get this down over my body. Not only that, but a bunch of the stitches would slip off the needles and I'd just have a mess. So I need to have a way to divide the stitches up so that they're laying flat and they're not in danger of falling off the needle so that I can put this on over my head. A lot of people will put half of the stitches on waist yarn or one of those barber cords, um, but then you have to take the time to put the stitches onto waist yarn or onto the barber cord, and then you have to take them off of the waist yarn or the barber cord and put them back on the needles. I prefer to do it this way because it's much faster. I take a second needle, same size that you're working with. I have quite a few pairs of needles, so this is easy for me. And I just knit it onto the second needle. It's a little bit funky right here at the, as you move from one needle to the other. The very beginning can be a little bit funky. But I just knit half of the stitches onto a second needle. So now I'm going to knit around until I hit the center of the other underarm and then I'm gonna come back and show you. So if you're knitting a big sweater, pause this video, knit around to the other underarm and then hit play again. I've got both of my needles on and you can see the stitches are all lying flat. They're not bunched up anywhere and I have extra needle out the ends so nothing is going to get stretched out and pop off the end of the needle. Nothing is in danger of being lost and I have plenty of room here that I can just 
try this on without having to worry about messing stuff up. The reason I like to have the needles start and stop in the underarm is because that leaves your whole front and back nice and smooth because there is, it, it is a little bit funky where the two needles come together when they hang down as you're wearing them. It can kind of distort this length right here. So I like to have that in the underarm because you're not generally looking at your underarm too much for length. So once you have your sweater on two cables or maybe you have half of the stitches on waist yarn or half of your stitches on barber cords, then we're gonna try this on. I'm gonna show you just as soon as I change my camera around. When you try on your sweater, you want to try it on over what you're planning to wear under it. So if you're planning to wear your sweater over a dress, wear that dress or a, a tank top, just wear that tank top. I'm planning to wear this sweater over my bare skin, but I'm not about to sit here without a shirt on. So I've got just a t-shirt on that I'm gonna put it on over. Since my stitches are separated half and half on two different cables, I can just pop this sweater on. Make sure you have the back to the back. If you haven't woven in the ends, it can be very easy to tell where the back is in my sweaters because you can find your tail from your cast on. Remember your beginning of the round is at your center back. So your tail from your cast on will be the back of your sweater. And then you can just pop it on. There you go. You're trying on your sweater. When you first try it on, you've knit an inch or two of body underneath the underarms. What you wanna check for is to make sure that it's fitting right. You don't want it too big. You don't want it too small. Check the width, but I also want to make sure that you check the depth of the yoke. If it is really tight up in your armpit, you may need to go add some depth to your yoke. So you would just rip back to the bottom of your yoke, knit another, however much you need, and then split for sleeves again. If it's way too low and you don't have color work, you can rip back and rip back some of your yoke and put it back on your needles and go again. But you're checking the depth of the yoke and you're checking that the sleeves are not too small, the sleeves are not too big. You're checking that you like how much ease you have in the body. Remember the ease you have in the body is how much bigger than your body the sweater is. You can see I've got some positive ease here. I don't want this one to fit super tight, so I'm pleased with the fit of this. I don't want it to be super tight in my armpits. You can see I've got a couple inches under my arm. I don't know if you can actually see. <laughs> there might be like the dark t-shirt with the dark yarn might be making it impossible to see, but you can see that you need to have enough waist yarn for your sleeve stitches to go on hold so that you can easily try it on and they lay how they should. So now that you've tried it on, if you like the fit, you're now going to proceed with knitting the body. One of the best things about top-down sweaters is that you can easily adjust the length of the body. I am tall. I always knit my bodies longer to accommodate my height. You might be short and want to knit it shorter. So you can just try it on as you go and you can knit until you'll see in the work body section, it tells you knit to a certain length or to however many inches or centimeters short of desired length. The distance short of desired length is the length of your ribbing. So that's telling you how long the ribbing, of your hem ribbing is going to be. So if you want to have your body length be 14 inches, you go 14 minus two, you're knitting your body until it's 12 inches long. You can make it longer, you can make it shorter, you can try it on as you go, or you can even lay your sweater out over top of another garment that fits you how you want this one to fit you. Remember, when you're comparing lengths of garment, you need to look at the total length of the garment, not just the body length, because the depth of your yoke is going to affect where, like the total length of your sweater. So make sure that you're comparing total length to total length. If you're laying your sweater on top of an already existing garment that you wanna match the length of. So knit your sweater. Now I want you to knit your sweater. If you're doing a children's size, make sure that you follow the recommended length in the 
pattern, but if you're knitting one for yourself, feel free to adjust the body length. I'm gonna go knit the body on my little sweater, and I'm going to come back onto this video when we get to the work hem section. So I'm gonna knit the body, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna work through the work hem section with you. So pause this video, go knit your sweater body, which may take you quite a while. This is the biggest chunk of work of the whole sweater. So go knit your sweater body, and then come back and we'll work through the work hem section. All right, we're back and we're ready to work the hem. You've just finished working the body and we're going to work the hem. And I wanna talk about this sentence right here for a minute. Switch to smaller size needles. When you work ribbing, this knit one, purl one repeat, you're bringing the yarn to the front, then to the back, then to the front, then to the back. And every time you move the yarn to the front and to the back and to the front and to the back, you're adding a little more yarn into this fabric. So ribbing, the ribbing itself, Here's ribbing. The ribbing itself has more yarn in it than the stockinette does because you're bringing the yarn from front to back to front to back to front to back. You're changing the position of the yarn. That means that your ribbing fabric, if it is worked on the exact same needle size as your stockinette fabric, your ribbing fabric is going to be much larger, much wider than your stockinette fabric. So if you do not go down a couple needle sizes, your ribbing is going to be too wide for your stockinette and that fabric, that extra fabric needs to have somewhere to go and it's going to end up flipping up like this so your ribbing will flip up if you have it <coughs> excuse me if you have it knit on the same size needles that you use to work your body with so that is why we switch to smaller size needles if you have a hem if you already have a sweater with a hem where the ribbing just wants to flip up the first thing I want you to do about that I want you to block it sometimes blocking it solves the problem and everything is fine but if blocking it does not solve the problem, you're gonna to need to rip that ribbing out and you're going to re-knit it on a smaller size needle and then you block it again and see if that solved the problem. Remember, block it first because blocking solves a lot of problems and it might just need to be blocked. Okay, now we're coming here, we're gonna actually do the thing. So we're switching to smaller size needles Here's my US size three. It's two sizes smaller than the size I used to knit the entirety of my body. And we're gonna work in this ribbing pattern again. This is just like the neckline, knit one, purl one, repeat from asterisk to asterisk to beginning of the round. So you knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, over and over and over, as many times as you need to get all the way around to the beginning again. Wrong way. Here we are, I've got my beginning of the round marker here. I'm going to just remove it because it's gonna fall off anyway. I'm gonna pull this needle completely out just to get it out of the way. If you are filling up your cable, you don't need to worry about pulling it through. I just have done that to keep it out of my way. Take your new needle and you just start working on the new needle. And eventually when you get around to the beginning of the round, all of your stitches will be on your new needle and you'll have switched needle sizes. So I want you to work this hem, work your ribbing pattern all the way around to the beginning of the round, and then I want you to knit to the appropriate length. Oop, I'm trying to zoom in, I keep going the wrong way. So we're gonna continue in ribbing by repeating round one, round one here. I may change this to ribbing round before I update the pattern until your ribbing measures one inch or two and a half centimeters. So you just continue this round over and over and over again until it measures this length. And then we're gonna come back and we're going to talk about what it means to bind off in pattern. I'm gonna show you what it means and I'm gonna show you how to make sure you don't bind off too tightly. So work your ribbing and then come back when you're ready to bind off. It's time to bind off in pattern. The first thing we need to figure out is what does this in pattern thing mean? So we're gonna look back to round one where it tells us how to work our ribbing. This knit one, purl one, this repeat of your ribbing, that's your pattern. Knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one. If you're knitting a different pattern than this, your pattern might be different than knit one, purl one. For example, if you're knitting a two by two ribbing, you're gonna have knit two 
purl two. That is gonna be your pattern. And so you'll knit two, then purl two. So you'll continue in whatever pattern it was you were knitting as you knit your ribbing on your hem. Now we're going to bind off. I've already knit the first stitch past my stitch marker. I always do that when I'm working in the round so that my stitch marker doesn't fall off. I'm gonna pull that loop to the side. Here we are, we're ready to bind off. So I've knit the first stitch here that's in pattern. I'm gonna pull it a little bit loose because we want to make sure that we're binding off a little bit loosely. If you bind off and you pull the yarn as tight during your bind off as when you're actually knitting, you're gonna end up with a really tight bind off that is going to pull in and constrict. If it's on your hemline, it can be a tight line around your hips. If it's on your sleeves, it'll be an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable sleeve cuff. So I'm gonna show you how to do it loosely. I've knit the first one purl the second one, then I use my left hand needle to lift the first stitch over the second one. I've got one stitch over here on my right hand needle. Ignore all of these that are back here behind the beginning of the round marker. Now with my right hand needle, I'm gonna pull that loose. Do you see how I have this nice and loose, this loop here on my right hand needle? I want to bind off loosely, so I pull this up loose. Now I'm gonna come here to my next stitch, I'm going to knit it. Now I'm gonna pull the first stitch on my right hand needle over the second one to bind it off. Now I'm gonna pull the only the one loop on my right hand needle, I'm gonna pull it up loose. You can see I've got it quite loose on there. Purl the next stitch. The first stitch on the right hand needle gets slipped over the second stitch to bind it off. And I pull it up loose. Knit the next stitch, pass it over. Pull it up loose. You can see I've got it pretty loose here. This stitch is pretty loose on my needle. If I were to pull it tight like this and work my bind off, with my loop tight like this, I'm gonna end up with a bind off that is way, way, way too tight. I'm gonna pull it up loose. I'm gonna bind off. I'm gonna pull it loose. Keep in mind that as you're pulling this loop loose, it's slightly tightening the last loop that you slipped over. So you can pull it quite a bit looser than you think and it will be okay. Pull it up loose. You can watch. As I'm pulling this one, this one down here is gonna tighten. Purl it, pass it over, pull it up loose. Knit, pass it over, pull it up loose. Purl, pass it over, pull it up loose. Knit, pass over, pull up loose. You can see that my bind off edge, even though I'm pulling this stitch super duper loose, this bind off edge doesn't look sloppy or stretched out. It looks nice and neat and tidy, but it still stretches. My ribbing can stretch out. It's not gonna be as stretchy as a German twisted cast on, as our cast on edge, but it's still quite flexible. This is gonna be comfortable. It's not gonna create a tight line over your hips. It's not gonna make it difficult to put the sweater on over your head. It was gonna fit nicely. So we're gonna keep going like this. We're going to bind off a bit loosely as we go around. And when you come around and you get to the end, and you only have one stitch left on your left hand needle and you have one stitch on your right hand needle, then come back because I need to show you how to finish this circular bind off so that we can prevent this problem here. I've already done this sleeve so I can use it to show you I've done things wrong. Do you see how we've got this weird gap and step? I'm gonna fold that down a little bit. I've got this weird gap and step here this is the bind off, a circular bind off. And I've finished it, just continued binding off around to the end and then just pulled the 
working yarn through the very last stitch and you end up with this nonsense going on. And yes, you can use your yarn tail and sew it closed when you're finishing off the sweater, but I'm gonna show you how to prevent this. So keep working your bind off until you have one stitch on your left hand needle and one stitch on your right hand needle, and then come back and I'll show you how to prevent that. Right, you have one stitch left on your right hand needle and one on your left hand needle and we're about to finish this bind off. So we're going to bind off this last stitch. So we purl the very last stitch, pass the first stitch over. We're down to one stitch on the right hand needle. Now ordinarily you would break your working yarn and just draw it through and be done and carry on. But we're going to finish this bind off neatly so that you have a smooth join. What you're gonna do is you're kinda come over here to your very first bound off stitch and you're gonna look at the top of it. We're not looking at it from this side. We're gonna roll it up and we're gonna look at the very top. You can see we've got two legs here. We're gonna pick up a stitch through the very top of your first bound off stitch. So we're gonna insert our right hand needle through the top. So we're coming right here at the very tippy top. We're inserting our needle. We've got both legs. We've got both legs on the needle. We're gonna grab our working yarn and pull it through. And I want you to pull this nice and snug because we've gotta pull this gap closed. So this one needs to be snug. Pull that nice and snug. Then take your left hand needle and take your first stitch on the right hand needle and pass it over the loop that you just picked up. Now you have one stitch on your right hand needle. You're going to break your working yarn. Now this is very important. Don't pull up a huge loop and then break the working yarn somewhere on the right hand side of your last bound off stitch. You're going to end up breaking the wrong leg of the yarn and end up with a piece way too short to weave in. I learned that one the hard way. So make sure that you come over here to your working yarn over on the left side of your stitch and break your yarn over here and then pull your last loop through. And now you have a nice smooth join in your bind off. You do have a little tiny bump right here, but when we weave in the ends, that will disappear. So you have a nice, smooth, bound off round. Now we're gonna move to working on the sleeves. We have the body all done now, and it's time to knit the sleeves. You can see I've already knit the first sleeve, for you because I wanted to have it ready to demonstrate. We're gonna pick up this sleeve together and we're gonna work through it together. One of the main things people worry about when picking up sleeves is this problem right here. You can see there's a giant hole in the underarm. I did this wrong on purpose so I could show you that. So we've got a giant hole in the underarm, underarm on this side. This side doesn't have as big of a hole but it does have a little bit of a hole you can see right here that strain isn't attractive and with time that will only get bigger. So how do we prevent this giant hole in our underarm when we're picking up the sleeves? And if we do have this giant hole in our underarm, how do we fix it? I'm gonna show you how to fix it when we're in the finishing section of the sweater. So I'll show you how to fix it then, but right now I'm gonna show you how to pick up sleeves in a way that prevents that hole. So we're back here. Here's our pattern. Using larger size knitting needles, so that's our US size five for this one, and it tells you to place the number of stitches you put on hold. So remember when we split body and sleeves, when we were done with the yoke and we split body and sleeves, we put a certain number of stitches on hold on waist yarn here. Now we are picking, uh, Am I on the right spot? We're picking up the exact same number of stitches. It's every single stitch that's on this waist yarn here. We're gonna pick that up. Then we're gonna pick up and knit the underarm stitches. These are the ones that we cast on with backwards loop right here. We're gonna pick up these underarm stitches. We're gonna place the beginning of the round marker and we're going to start working in the round on our sleeves. I'm gonna push that out of the way. Here's my US size five. I like to start so that I'm going from right to left. It's just a much easier way to start. If I tried to start picking up, I guess this way is right to left as well. I want to go from right to left around this way, then the other way. I don't, 
No, this way is not right to left, here. So if I was trying to pick up from left to right, if you're left-handed, that might be easier, but for right-handed people, you want to move from right to left, that's easier. So I'm gonna break this knot, so it's easier later. I'm not going to take the waist yarn out. I don't wanna have all of these stitches loose and falling apart while I'm trying to pick them up. So I'm gonna leave the waist yarn in all of these stitches until the very end after I've picked them all up. So I'm gonna take my working needle, I'm gonna zoom in so you can really see what I'm doing. You can, the very first one will often have kind of tightened up, so you might wanna pull this up to loosen it up again because it does tend to do this thing. As there's some strain on the armhole, you can see that it's kind of popped back down in there. So we can pull it back up by just pulling on the waist yarn. And now we take our needle and we slide it in. We're not gonna change the orientation of the stitch. You're not coming in it knit wise. If you come in it this way, you're gonna twist the stitch. We're just coming in it purl wise, straight underneath the waist yarn. I like to just slip it underneath the waist yarn. And we're just gonna come underneath the waist yarn through every single stitch to slide your needle in there. When I've gotten about halfway, I'll pull my needle through so that these stitches are sitting on the cord. I'll flip the sweater over and I'll continue with the other half of the stitches. Just picking them all up. Now here we are to the last two stitches. You can see they've been pulled down so they're really tight. You can take your waist yarn and kind of tug them up a little bit so that you can get your needle underneath that stitch. And then I like to pull on it a little bit, get it back to its proper size. Now the very last one is way down in there. I'm gonna, this is my waist yarn, this is my waist yarn. I'm just gonna use that to pop it back up again and pick up that stitch. Do you, can, you can see how there's a left side and a right side of that stitch. Make sure the right side leg is to the front. Now I have all of the stitches and I'm just going to pull out my waist yarn. So I've got all of the loose stitches are picked up. I'm just gonna grab an end of the waist yarn and pull and it comes right out and I'm ready to go. Now we're coming to the point where we are going to prevent those holes in the underarm and pick up our underarm stitches. Now I want you to look at this. We're gonna be picking up the stitches down here. This is our first cast on stitch down here. And our last picked up stitch is over here. You can see there's a tremendous gap right here. And this is why you end up with a big hole. There's this giant gap that has nothing in it that we need to fill in. So I'm gonna back this out a little bit. And I'm gonna show you how we do this. First of all, I'm going to set my needles up so I have a little bit on my right hand needle. Remember we're doing magic loop here a little bit on my left hand needle. I don't have quite half and half, but you can see this is the top of the sleeve. This is kind of the side and bottom of the sleeve. And I have it on the two needles like this so that I have plenty of space to work and I'm not having to strain or switch to another needle right at the underarm because I don't wanna pull on this and stress it further and make it worse. This marker is just here hanging out. I'm gonna take it off. I just put it here so I'd have it handy when I needed it. I'm gonna put it to the side. I'm gonna actually close it first, then put it to the side. Now we're gonna get our working yarn. I want you to leave a really long tail. You can't see the whole tail in the video. It's about 10 inches long. That way, when it comes time to weave in this end, because you're gonna have an end to weave in, then you have a nice long piece of yarn here that you can use to tighten up any holes that you may have in the underarm. You may have some, you may not, that need to be kind of snugged down. But I'm holding it in a little loop and I'm going to pick up extra stitches. So remember, here's our first underarm stitch. Here we are way over here at our last stitch that was put on hold. 
we need to fill in this area here. Depending on the size of your sweater, the gauge of your yarn and whatnot, this little gap might differ in size. You're gonna pick up one to two extra stitches right in here. So this is our first underarm stitch right here. If I just jumped over there, I'd have a giant hole. So I'm gonna look in here. This column of stitches goes to this stitch right here on the needle, so I'm not gonna pick up in here, but I'm gonna come into this part right here and I'm gonna pick up two extra stitches. So right here, I'm inserting my needle. I'm making sure that I have two strands on the needle. I have two. Let me see if I can separate them so you can see it. I have two strands on the needle. That way I don't stretch out the edge and make another hole. I'm gonna pull that loop through. So this is our working yarn. I made a loop with it and I'm pulling that loop through this area where I just picked up. You can see it does get a little bit stretched. We have a long tail, we can tighten that up later. Now I'm holding both strands. So one is my working yarn and one is my long tail. I'm holding both of them in my left hand and I'm gonna work with both of them on this next stitch that I'm picking up. And I'm gonna pick up right here. And I'm gonna pick up that yarn. Now I've picked up two extra stitches. Now I'm gonna drop my tail and I like to stuff my tail down through the armhole so that it's out of the way. I'm gonna reach up from the inside and pull it down so it's really out of the way. And now we are to our underarm stitches. This is where we cast on with backwards loop. I'm gonna move that out of the way so we can see a little easier. I'm going to show you right where to pick up. Let's zoom in. I'm sorry I zoomed the wrong way every time. Here we are, way zoomed in. You can see that right here, is where a column of stitches begins. And right here is where a column of stitches begins. And right here, and right here, and so on. Oh, no, nope, here it is, and right here. And so on for every single new stitch that you created in the underarm. We're not gonna pick up through the very top of that column because it's all bunched up. It's gonna be very difficult to pick that up. But you can see right to the left of that column, there's a little gap right here, right in this gap. And if you roll up, you can see there's two strands of yarn over my needle. So this is what it looks like from the top. You have the little chain of new stitches. We're gonna pick up in this spot, in this spot, in this spot, and so on. So we're gonna come with our working yarn. We're going to insert our needle through that little hole, grab our working yarn, and pull up a loop. Next spot is right here. Insert your working yarn, pull up a loop. The next spot is right here. Insert your needle, grab your working yarn, pull up a loop. Once you have picked up half of your underarm stitches, you're gonna take your beginning of the round marker and pop it on your needle. That's the beginning of your round for your sleeve. Now we're going to pick up three more. Right here, right here, and then the last one is right here. You can see here's the column of stitches coming down from the yoke and going onto the body. And here's the column of stitches from your last cast on stitch. So we're right to the left of that in this little hole draw up a loop. Now we need to pick up the same number of stitches in this hole as we did in the first hole, that gap between your underarm stitches and your top of the sleeve stitches. So we've got a big space here and we need to pick up two stitches. So I'm gonna pick up right here in this spot, right here. I'm gonna pick up right here and I'm gonna pick up right here. That's where I'm gonna pick up because I've got two strands and I've got two strands. If I come up here, I'm picking up the bars between the stitches and that's gonna create a weird hole. If I'm coming up here, I'm picking up the stitch that's underneath the stitch on my needle. So I wanna come down here and I wanna pick up in this spot, doo -doo -doo, right here. Ooh, I'm creating a hole. Nope, I'm not gonna pick up there. I'm gonna scooch over a little bit and pick up here. Yep, I grabbed some extra yarn. 
There we go. I've still got a little bit of a stretched out stitch. We're gonna pick up in this spot right here. See if that helps out. You can see this isn't a completely foolproof method. That's why we've got our extra long tail of yarn and we'll take care of that in the end, but this will be better than, better than nothing. So I've picked up my two extra stitches and now I'm ready to knit in the round. So I'm just gonna start knitting the stitches that are on my needle. This might give you motion sickness being so close to my knitting. Here we go, back way off. We're just gonna knit around magic loop style. I want you to knit one full round. We're gonna have to decrease our extra stitches away, but if we're decreasing the loops of yarn that we picked up, they're going to stretch out a lot and you're gonna end up with more loose stitches in your underarm. So we're just gonna knit around one full time. It's actually more like one and a half times and I'll explain that in just a minute. So here we are. This is our last stitch that we had on hold. This is the stitch that we picked up. Make sure, remember, we used both the working yarn and the tail when we picked up this stitch. So make sure you get both of those legs when we're, you're working this one. Oops, I didn't get both of those legs. Now I've got both of those legs. Now we're back to the beginning of the round, but we haven't knit these few stitches that we picked up yet. So we need to knit around one more time. I guess it's kind of twice. However many times it ends up being, make sure that you knit all of your picked up stitches at least one time. If you're working on a much bigger sleeve than me, keep in mind that you can just pause this video wherever if you need to catch up with me because I am knitting a teeny tiny sweater. The last little bit. Okay, we're at the beginning of the round. Now it's time to start decreasing away your extra stitches that you picked up. Now, we picked up and knit six stitches in the underarm. So take however many stitches you knit in the underarm, divide it by three. That's how many you're gonna work past your beginning of the round marker. So I picked up six, so I'm gonna knit these three stitches. One, two, three. Now we're to the two extra stitches. And I want to decrease these stitches away with the stitches that go with, with the stitches that you placed on hold, basically the upper part of your sleeve. I want to knit them away with the stitches from the upper part of the sleeve. So I'm going to knit this first stitch, this first extra stitch, and now here's my second extra stitch. And here's my first stitch that I had set on hold earlier. I'm going to knit these two together. On the left hand side, we're knitting these two together. The left hand side, of the beginning of the round marker when you're looking at it as you knit. So you're knitting two together on this side. You've eliminated one of those stitches and you can see since I've knit two together, my knit two together leans to the right. So you can see it's leaning towards the, un the beginning of the round which is at the center of your underarm. So you want these extra stitches to be removed in a way that kind of tilts towards your armpit. That way they'll be, they'll be kind of like a little gusset there that disappears nicely into your underarm. We're going to knit around to our extra picked up uh, stitches on the other side of the sleeve.
I am going to knit to six stitches before the beginning of the round marker. To find my number of stitches before the beginning of the round marker, I take half of my underarm stitches, so my underarm was six stitches, so half of that is three, plus my two extra stitches that I picked up, which brings us to five, and then one more, which brings us to six. So I've got five, six. So here are my one, two, three underarm stitches. Here are my two extra stitches that I picked up, and there's one more stitch. This is the last one that was on waste yarn earlier. I am going to decrease these two stitches away with each other, but on this side, I'm going to slip, 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 knit. So I'm going to slip the first stitch as if to knit, slip the second stitch as if to knit. I've got them on my right hand needle. I insert my left hand needle into the front of those stitches. My right hand needle's in the back and I knit those two together. You can see I've got a left leaning decrease there. So when I'm removing this extra stitches from this side, they're leaning towards the beginning of the round marker. They're leaning towards the middle of my armpit. They're gonna disappear into the underarm. And now I keep going. I've reached the beginning of the round. I've still got one extra stitch to get rid of over here on the left hand side. So I knit one, two, three. That's half of my underarm, half of my underarm stitches. Now this is my last stitch that my last extra stitch. And here's the stitch right next to it. We're going to knit those two together. And now they're gone. And I'm going to work around to the other side. I am trying to think about where my measuring tape is right now, because I'm gonna to need to measure in a minute. And it tends to grow legs. The little boys like my retractable tape measure and they play with it all the time. I have two of them and I only know where one of them is. And now, right now I don't even know where that one is. So here we're coming around to our underarm again. And I'm going to knit to five stitches before the beginning of the round marker this time. Last time I knit to six stitches, so it's one stitch less than last time. So one, two, three. Here's my extra one. And here's one more to decrease it away with. So I've got five left. Now I'm gonna work slip, slip, knit with these two stitches together and get rid of my last extra stitch. Now I work to the beginning of the round. Now I stop and take this knot out of my yarn. There we go. Now, I don't like to work in the beginning of, in the round like this on my sleeves where the beginning of the round marker is in the middle of one side of my magic loop. I really kind of hate working like this. So what I do at this point is I'm at the beginning of the round marker. I take it off because it's gonna fall off anyway. I set it to the side because I'll need it again in a minute. But this is my beginning of the round here. I pull my stitches, or not my stitches, my knitting needles through. So I've got all of my stitches on the loop. My needle points are over here to the right. And I'm gonna sandwich these two together and I'm going to split them roughly in half. I don't count, you can count, but I don't. I just sandwich it together and move over here to the left and pinch it together and just roughly, eh, this is good enough. That's roughly half and I pull my cable through to the left. Now I'm gonna work magic loop like this where the beginning of the round is right here on this side where my two needles come out. This is how I prefer to work my sleeves. But I still need to make sure I keep track of where my beginning of the round is because if you're TV knitting on a very long sleeve, it can be very easy to accidentally work your sleeve decreases on the wrong side of the sleeve. So since I learned that one the hard way, I now always take a removable stitch marker 
and I just pop it in here. So you can see this is the split, my beginning of the round between those two stitches. I just grab a leg from each side of the beginning of the round, slip my removable stitch marker in there, and close it up. That's my beginning of the round side. As I work the sleeve, I'll move this up. I move it once a day usually, and it also functions quite nicely as a little progress keeper so I can see how much of the sleeve I've knit in any particular sitting. So I'm now set up like this, and you can see that the hole here isn't as bad, and the hole over here really isn't as bad. For some reason, the hole on this side is pretty much gone, but I've got a little bit of looseness going on over here, which if it doesn't bother you, you can leave it. But when it comes to the finishing section of this tutorial, I will show you how to tighten up those loose bits. So now I'm going to work. Let's see what our pattern says. Knit in the round for one inch. And then we work this decrease round. So we're going to go knit in the round for one inch. And we're going to measure from right here where you picked up your sleeve. It can be kind of hard to figure out exactly where it is, but you can feel on the inside there's a little ridge right here from your picked up stitches. This will make a little ridge, and you can measure from right there out until it's one inch, and then come back, and I will show you exactly where I measure from. I'll show you that measurement once I find my measuring tape, and we'll work through a decrease round together. So here we are with our one inch of sleeve that we've knit. We can feel right here, we can feel the little bump from the pickup is right here. So I'll set my tape measure right on the edge of it. I'll straighten out my sleeve a little bit so that I can try to measure it a straight line, but it's kind of hard because we're in the underarm where it wants to come up and then across. And here's an inch. If you were a little over or a little under, it's not a huge deal, but there's one inch that we have knit there, and now it's time for our first decrease round. So here we have it here. Knit one, knit two together, knit to three stitches before the beginning of the round. Slip, slip, knit, knit one. We've decreased two stitches. It will tell you two stitches decreased. It's telling you how many stitches we've decreased, but it's not telling you how many stitches will be left after you have decreased. So we're gonna do that now. We're at the beginning of the round. I'm going to knit one, then knit two together over here. Knit one, then for knit two together, we simply take our right hand needle, insert it through two stitches on our left hand needle as if to knit, and knit them together as if they are one stitch. We've knit two together, we've decreased one stitch on that side. And now we're going to knit around to three stitches before the beginning of the round. Remember, you can pause this video if you need to catch up with me for a minute. Here we are, I have three stitches left on my left hand needle. So that's three stitches before the beginning of the round. Now I'm going to slip, slip, knit, then knit the last stitch. So for slip, slip, knit, I'm using my right hand needle to slip the first stitch knit-wise. Then we're gonna slip the next stitch knit-wise. Then I'm gonna take my left hand needle, insert it into the front of those two stitches that I just slipped. Grab my yarn, pull it through. I'm knitting them together through the back loop. I have just slip, slip, knit. You can see that it leans towards the left here. So the reason why we use two different directional increases is because we're decreasing towards the underarm. So on the left hand over here, we're using knit two together, and knit two together is a right-leaning decrease, so it's leaning in towards the underarm. And over here on the right hand side, we use slip, slip, knit, which is a left-leaning decrease, so it leans to the left towards the underarm. Now we're going to read our next instruction. Continue knitting every round, repeating decrease round every sixth round. 
So I'm going to knit a few rounds and then I'm gonna show you how I count this. You can of course mark off every single round that you knit with a little tally mark and then after you've knit six, you can work the next decrease round. I never do that anymore. I just count the rounds as I work. I'm gonna work six rounds and then I'm gonna show you how I count that. I have knit a short little bit and I'm here to show you how I count my rounds so that I don't have to mark them off while I'm knitting the sleeve. I always do this on the side of the sleeve where you have the slip slip knit. You can see right here, this is a decrease. I always do it on the side where you have the slip slip knit because it's much easier to identify. Here's my little completed sleeve. You can very easily see the little slip slip knit. You've got the little bar of yarn coming over, it's leaning to the left. It's very easy to see all of your SSKs. Come around to the knit two together side. You can see where they are, but it's a lot harder to identify. You can't just quickly glance at it and see where your slips, your decrease is. So that's why I always count from the side that has my slip slip knit on it. So here I am right here. Here is my slip slip knit. I'm gonna get even closer. There we go. So I want you to notice, here is our decrease right here. My needle is underneath it, that's our decrease. The round we worked when we created this decrease was the round directly over it. This stitch right here that my needle is behind, this stitch was created on the decrease round. This was created on the round that we knit our slip slip knit on. And we also have a full round of stitches on the needles. You can't forget about the round of stitches on the needles. So what we're gonna do, I always count starting on this stitch that was created on the decrease round, and I don't count the round that's on the needles. So this is, I'm working a decrease round every sixth round. So sixth round, we're talking ordinal numbers here. It's not knit six rounds and then work decrease. It's on the sixth round. So we have first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and on the sixth one, which is the next round that we knit, we're going to work decreases. So one, two, three, four, five. Now notice I'm not counting the round that's on the needles because I'm counting this stitch here, which is the round, the decrease round, our previous decrease round. If you want to knit just the one, or count just the ones after the decrease round, you would go one, two, three, four, and five. So we've knit five rounds there. So on the sixth round, which is the next one, we're going to decrease again. I continue in this fashion. Ooh, I can't see what's going on. I work in this fashion all the way down the sleeve until I have worked the appropriate number of decreases. We're gonna, this camera card is full. We're gonna come here, continue, wait, no. Continue knitting in the round, repeating decrease round every sixth round a further four times. Then it tells you the stitch count. So a further four times means five total decreases because our first one here, so this one was number one, then we're working four more times. Nope, that's the wrong spot. Four more times right here. So one plus four is five. So we're working five total decrease rounds down our sleeve every sixth round as we go. So I want you to continue working down the sleeve in the fashion that we have established, continuing to decrease every however number of rounds your size calls for until you have finished all of the decreases. And then once you get there, you're going to measure the total length of your sleeve. I'm gonna show you right here. So mine says continue in stockinette by knitting every round until the sleeve measures four and a half inches from underarm. So here we are at the underarm. You can see we've got a nice line here showing me where the underarm is. So I'll just put my tape measure here where you can see the bend right there. I'll put my tape measure there and I'll measure down until we hit four and a half inches. Once I've hit four and a half inches, then it's time to work the cuff. So I want you to knit all of the decreases. Then once you've knit all of the decreases, 
you measure your sleeve length and you knit it. You continue knitting it in the round until you've reached the length specified. Or you can see on the pattern here, or one inch slash two and a half centimeters short of desired length. You may change your sleeve length. I always add an inch to two inches to my sleeve length because I am quite tall. So if you're going to modify your sleeve length, you want to look at how many inches short of desired length you want to knit because that's telling you how long your sleeve cuff is. So if you want to knit a 20 inch sleeve and it says, or to two inches short of desired length, you're gonna knit it until it's 18 inches long and then it's time for you to knit the cuff. You need to remember to leave space for your cuff if you're modifying your sleeve length. So I'm gonna go knit away on my little sleeve and then when it's time to work the cuff, I'll come back and I'll show you how we transition to working the cuff. All right, we've got the sleeve done here. You can see very easily the SSKs on this side of the sleeve. I'm gonna count them for you so you can see exactly where they are. One, two, three, four, five. So that's a total number of decreases. You can also count the number of stitches you have left to make sure it matches your final stitch count. Because when you look at the pattern here, you'll see here it tells you after you finish the increases, you will have 26 stitches left. It will give you the stitch count um, that you're supposed to have at the cuff. Now we're gonna make sure we're at the appropriate length, which is, oops, four and a half inches here. So we're gonna lay our tape measure out. Here's the underarm right here is that little bump. Remember where we picked up the underarm stitches, there's a little bump. So I'm gonna put my tape measure there and measure out. And I have four and a half inches. That's the total length of my sleeve. So now it's time to work the cuff. So here at Work Cuff, we switch to our smaller size needles. First of all, remember when we knit ribbing, we're actually creating a little bit of a larger fabric. So we switch to a smaller size needle to make sure that our ribbings don't flip up. And we're here again, knit one, purl one, repeat from asterisk to asterisk to beginning of the round. So we're just gonna work a round of ribbing and then we continue in that ribbing until our ribbing measures one inch from the beginning of the ribbing and then bind off in pattern. Now I've got this little note here. For baby sweaters, I like to use the elastic bind off on sleeve cuffs instead of a regular bind off. Sometimes people have a lot of trouble getting a regular bind off in pattern stretchy enough for a baby sleeve, and I think baby sleeves need to be especially loose. When I put sweaters on babies, I tend to pull open the sleeve, and I'll take my three fingers here like it's a pair of kitchen tongs and I'll just stick my hand all the way up the sleeve and grab their little fist up here and then draw it down the sleeve. So in order to do that, you have to have a really, really stretchy cuff. And you can see here that I have a really, really stretchy cuff. I can stick my fingers way up in there and it's just fine. But if you struggle with the, the bind off being too tight, you can use the elastic bind off here on sleeve cuffs instead of um, just the regular bind off and pattern. And that way you'll get an even stretchier um, cuff if you wanna do that. So here we're gonna switch to our new needles. And I'm gonna work the first round of the ribbing with you. And then I'm gonna turn you loose to knit the rest of the ribbing and we'll join back up again when it's time to bind off. So here we are. Remember the beginning of the round is down over here. I have my stitch marker down here, but if you'd like, you can move it up here so you can easily see what the beginning of the round is. Maybe I'll just do that. So I've moved it up here so that I know that the beginning of the round is on this side of the sleeve instead of this side of the sleeve. Although at this point, it doesn't matter all that much since you're just doing the same thing round and round again. So our ribbing pattern is knit one, purl one, repeated around. So knit one, purl one. And we just work our way around. I don't know if you can hear the rain on the roof today. It's very rainy today. We actually got snow on the mountains. It is the 21st of September today, and 
not last night, but the night before, was our first snow of the year. I've flipped it around so that I can move to the second side. I'm pulling my needle through. Now, when I'm knitting ribbing, and I am working in magic loop like this, where half of my stitches is on the cable and half is on the needle, I like to always end on a purl stitch. So this very last stitch over here should be a purl stitch. The reason for that is, the last one here is a knit. So when I come around to purl the first stitch on the new side, I have to bring my yarn to the front to purl it. That means I have a much longer strand of working yarn coming from the last stitch on the cable to the first stitch on the needle, which means it's gonna be kind of loose there where you are moving from one side to the other. I prefer to start with a knit stitch. So I'm just gonna purl this stitch, then I'm gonna pull my needle through to kick it back onto the cable. Now when I'm going to begin with a knit stitch, I'm just holding the yarn in the back so the yarn doesn't have to travel around the front. So I'm not going to end up with a gap right there. So we start on a knit stitch when we're working ribbing in magic loop style. Now we're gonna keep going all the way around the end. And there's our first round of ribbing done. I'm gonna set my larger needle to the side. I'm not gonna need that anymore. And now I'm just gonna work one inch in ribbing and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna do the bind off together. Here we are with the cuff done. I'm way zoomed in because I wanna show you something. After I have knit my first cuff, I don't knit the second cuff to the same measurement. I count the number of rows that I have in the ribbing in the first cuff, and I knit that same number of rows in the ribbing for the second cuff. cuff. So how we count the rows in ribbing, I'm gonna use my needle. It's really it makes it a lot easier to use something sharp and pointy. Thankfully, we've always got one handy. So I'm gonna count the rows in this ribbing. So it's kind of hard to see. I'm gonna to try to make this, fold this up away. Maybe you can see it a little easier, but you can see the little loops here, here, here. They're all kind of squished in a little bit. So it's a little bit harder to see. Make sure you're counting this with good light, but we're gonna count every time this loop comes around. Or you can also just count um, in the center of stitches here. And you can see this bar in the back, that's between every stitch. But I prefer to count the loops on the side. So I'll go, let's see here. <laughs> let's start right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got ten rounds in the cuff on my first cuff, but we need to remember that when you bind off, you're creating another round. So I want to knit until I have nine rounds done, and then the tenth one will be the round on which I bind off. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You need to remember that you have a round on the needles. So you have to count this round on the needles. That's your ninth round. And now when we do the bind off, we're gonna create the 10th round. So we'll have 10 rounds in each cuff. So we'll have the exact same number of rounds. So they will be the exact same length. I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit. There we go. So now we're going to bind off loosely in pattern again. I think actually on this one, I might show you how to do it with the elastic bind off. So to bind off loosely in pattern, remember we're knitting and purling, knitting and purling. If you have knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two, you'll knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two. Just continue in whatever pattern you have established in your cuff. So we're gonna knit the first one. I like to pull it a little bit snug so that I don't end up with a gap there. Purl the second one, take the first stitch, pass it over the second one, and then pull this up loose. Pull the stitch on your right hand needle up loose. Knit the next stitch pass that over, pull it up loose, purl the next stitch, 
pass it over, pull it up loose, and continue in this fashion if you want to bind off and pattern. But now we're going to, I'm gonna tink back to the beginning and I'm gonna show you how to do the elastic bind off just in case you wanna do that instead. Tink is knit backwards and that is why it's called tinking. Because if you write the word knit backwards, it's tink. Okay, now here we are. I've worked the very first stitch already. Well, let's go back to the very beginning. Here we go. So I'm at the very beginning. I'm gonna work the elastic bind off. Knit the first stitch, purl the second stitch. Take your left hand needle and insert it into the front of the two stitches on your right hand needle. Then knit those two stitches together through the back. Oops, they both slipped off my right hand needle. Knit those two stitches together through the back loop. I have one stitch on my needle. I'm going to knit the next stitch on my left hand needle. Then I, ins I have two stitches on my right hand needle. I take my left hand needle, insert it into the front of the two stitches on my right hand needle, and I knit those two stitches together through the back loop. I have one stitch on my right hand needle again. I work the next stitch on my left hand needle. I have two stitches on my right hand needle. I take my left hand needle and I insert it into the front of the two stitches on my right hand needle and I knit those two stitches together through the back loop. Then you just continue working in this fashion until you get around to the beginning. I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. If you don't want to work the elastic bind off and you just want to bind off in pattern, make sure you're doing it loosely. But if you don't want to fuss around with binding off loosely in pattern on a sleeve cuff, then you can use the elastic bind off instead. You don't want a tight sleeve cuff because that's just really uncomfortable to wear. Whoops, didn't grab my yarn. So I'm going to work around to the beginning of the round. Oops, here we go. I keep losing my working yarn. I'm gonna knit around until the beginning of the round and then I'm gonna show you what this elastic bind off looks like and I'm gonna show you how to finish this off so that you have a nice smooth join in the round so we don't end up with that stair step look. Remember to pause this video if I'm getting ahead of you so that we can do this together. All right, I have one stitch left on my right hand needle. I've worked all the stitches on my left hand needle. You can see very clearly that if I just broke this yarn and pulled it through, I'd have a big mess right here at the beginning of the round. We don't want that. So what we're going to do is we're gonna take our right hand needle and we're going to find the top of the very first bound off stitch. Let me get up closer so you can see that more easily. You can, oh, maybe we zoom in instead. Way in, there we go. So you can see right here, that right here, that very first stitch that we knit, we've got two legs coming around right here. We're going to insert the tip of our right hand needle underneath both of those legs. 
we're going to grab our working yarn and draw through a loop. I like to pull these a little bit snug because we're at the beginning of the round. I don't want to end up with a gap or a hole here. So I like to pull these a little bit snug to make sure we don't end up with a hole right here. So now I've got two stitches on my right hand needle. I'm going to take the one that's to the right side and I'm going to pass it over the one that's on the left side. Now I have one single loop here. I'm going to zoom back out so we can see this a little easier. Make sure that you only ever break the working yarn on this side of the stitch. Never draw this up really big and break it somewhere in here. You're going to break it off way too loose. So break it off over here and then pull that through. And you can see we've eliminated that giant stair step and we have a nice smooth join in the round. Now here we have the elastic bind off. You can see that right now it's flaring a little bit. That's because when we knit the two stitches together we create a little more fabric there. We involve a little more yarn in the bind off which is what makes it so stretchy. But here we go. Here's it stretches huge. Absolutely huge. It stretches really nice and clean. Let's compare it to the other one. So this one is bound off in pattern. This one is bound off with the elastic bind off. You can see if you're just looking at them, they look extremely similar, both from the top and from the side. This one just has a little bit more bulk, but if you have a sleeve cuff, when you wear it and when you work with it, the ribbing is going to stretch out. So it's going to end up looking like this after you've blocked it and after a wear or two, and here's the elastic bind off one, it's gonna end up looking like this after you've worn it. Let's see how far they stretch compared to each other. You can see, oops, the elastic bind off goes that far, the bind off in pattern only goes that far. So the elastic bind off does give you a little more stretch if you want that. And don't worry about it being a little bit bulky right now because when you wear that sweater, it's going like you can see the the ribbing on the cuff of the sweater I'm wearing. It's not all scrunched in super tight anymore like when you first knit it. It gets a little bit stretched out and over time it's going to relax further and further and further. So your bind off is not going to be flaring like this after you've blocked it or after you've worn it one time. So don't worry about it looking a little bit um a little bit bigger right now. Remember, if something looks funny, just block it first and see what happens. Okay, now we're going to move on to the finishing section. Here we are to finishing weave in ends, wash and block to measurements. If you're gonna block to measurements, we're going to look at, where is my schematic? The schematic right here. Remember we have the graphic that shows how big everything is and all of the measurements for all of the sizes and where those measurements are taken from. To be honest, when I block a sweater, I usually just lay it out flat and measure it to make sure it's still okay, but I don't generally do much to block it to measurements because it doesn't generally need much. If you've got your gauge right, you should be good to go. So now we're going to do our weave in ends. We've got all of these ends. So we're going to need a tapestry needle here any tapestry needle will do. We're gonna take our sweater and we're gonna turn it inside out. I'm gonna take the stitch marker off first because I don't need that there anymore. We're gonna turn our sweater inside out and we're going to weave in all of the ends on the wrong side of the sweater, on the inside, so you'll never see them ever. Okay, here we go. We're also going to fix the holes in the underarm if you have any. This one still needs to be fixed, so we're going to fix that. First, we're going to start with weaving in ends on ribbing. So this is the hem right here. This is our ribbing. I'm going to zoom in a bit so that we can see this really up close. So I'm going to take my yarn tail and thread it through my tapestry needle. I like to take my yarn between my two fingers. I've got it between my pointer finger in my thumb and I twist it. I twist it really hard. You can see I've got it quite twisted. Then I bring up a little loop. It's in my left hand. And then I shove that loop through. It doesn't often need to be shoved through, but I'll use my thumbnail to push it through if it needs pushed through. And then I'll put that loop through the tapestry needle. If you try to take 
just the cut end of your yarn, you can see that after it's been laying there for a while and you've been working on your sweater, it starts to unravel and it starts to get really loose. So if I try to take this end of yarn and stick it through my tapestry needle, it's gonna be a bit of a nightmare. It's gonna be a mess. I'm gonna have to put it in my mouth and get fuzzies in my mouth. So I like to just do my method where I twist up a little loop and then push it through. So here we've got our tapestry needle is threaded. I'm gonna turn it around so that I'm working this away from me. So this is where we brought it together. I'm gonna to take my tapestry needle and you can see that the bind off came this way. We worked, when we were binding off, we were coming this way. You can see the direction of the Vs goes this way. So I'm going to finish this off by taking my yarn. You can see it comes out right there. I'm gonna put my tapestry needle through just to the left of that, just through the stitch of that, just to make sure that we're pulling it that way. We don't wanna pull it this way and possibly loosen up this join right here. We're pulling it to the left to keep it nice and tight. So I'll bring it through. I came from the right side of the sweater to the wrong side. I'm pulling it through. I'm gonna pull that snug. And now we're going to weave in this end. We're going to weave in this end into this column of knit stitches right here. And we're gonna follow the path of the yarn and we're gonna duplicate it on this leg of that knit column. So I'm gonna take my tapestry needle and I'm gonna follow the path that the yarn takes. I'm gonna go in this one first. So you can see it comes this way and then it comes through here. And then I'm gonna bring it around to the right and come on to the next loop. And you can twist your needle around like this, it's a circular motion, and just go through all of those loops. You can see that I'm under the loops of the ribbing, and now I'm just gonna pull my tapestry needle through. If you, there, it's disappeared. If you don't want to go through multiple loops at the same time, you can just draw it through one stitch at a time. That's totally fine too. We're following the path of the yarn through the ribbing. And we're coming up. I like to come to the sweater body, to the stockinette that you have in your sweater. And once we get there, I like to transition from working in the ribbing to working in the reverse stockinette that we have here. This is because this ribbing is extremely short. We've only got an inch of ribbing here. I like to weave in about two inches of the end to get a really secure join. Now we're up here to the reverse stockinette and on reverse stockinette, on that wrong side of the fabric, we're going to follow the path of the yarn again and we're gonna kind of duplicate stitch our yarn end into the reverse stockinette fabric. So you can see here, this stitch comes up this way, it goes behind here, and then it comes around down over here. But then we're at the join of the ribbing and the reverse stockinette. So I want to just jump up one more row. So I'm gonna take my yarn, I'm gonna slide it underneath this loop here, and underneath this loop here. And now I'm up here where I can work in two rows of the reverse stockinette. So I'm gonna follow the path of this stitch. You can see it starts here. It comes up this way. Then it comes over the top here and it goes down here. And then that yarn comes down through this, this stitch here. So I'm coming down this way. Now that yarn comes out of this stitch and it goes around this way and it comes through this bump over here. And so I'm gonna follow that path through there, draw my yarn through. Then that yarn comes around this way, comes under here, and then it goes into this stitch here. Then it comes around this way, it goes under this bump here. Doesn't really wanna slide under there. And then it comes up this way under this bump over here. I'm sorry about this awkward transition, but my camera battery just died. So we're here weaving in the ends still. I've got only about half an inch, so I'm gonna go a little bit further. I'm gonna follow this around and continue duplicate stitching this yarn tail until I've woven in about an inch 
in addition to, so I've got an inch here in the ribbing, and then I want an inch here in the, um, in the stockinette portion of the sweater. That way I know that my end is really secure, and not only that, but that way if I have to ever um, pull it back out again and change something, I have a little more of an end to work with if I have to do that, but I don't generally pull things out. I think I'm gonna do this one and then call it good. Here we go. Now I'm gonna take my, ne my needle, my scissors, and I'm gonna trim this off. Now I'm not gonna trim this off super short. I'm not gonna trim it flush with the fabric. Like say right there is flush with the fabric. It's not focusing on my scissors. I'm not gonna cut it flush with the fabric. I want to give a little bit of distance. Not quite a quarter of an inch maybe like three sixteenths of an inch, somewhere in there. And I leave a little bit sticking up. You can see it's not a ton, it's not a ton, but it's just a tiny little bit sticking out the back of the fabric. When you cut this yarn tail off, just completely flush with the fabric, a lot of times that little tail, especially if you're working with a slippery yarn, that little tail likes to slip back out a stitch and it can pop forward to the front of your fabric. So I like to leave a little bit of a tail, that way there's enough yarn there that it can grip into the fabric and stay put. And this is especially true if you're working with superwash or something slippery. Um, I know you're all chomping at the bit to see how we fix this, but I'm gonna do that in its own section, okay? So just bear with me now. So we've got the, um, Yarn tails on the cuffs, you would work in the same way that we just worked the yarn tail here on the hem. We're gonna come up here and we're gonna do the one on the neckline first, because or next, I guess, because when you cast on, it's a little bit different than a bind off, so I'm gonna show you how I do the cast on, um, weave in the end at the cast on edge. Hmm. So I've got it inside out, and you can see that if I pull the cast, and here's where my yarn tail is, if I pull the cast on apart, you can see that there's a little divot there, just like a little valley right here. I like to take my yarn, and this is the front side of the fabric, this is the right side. I go from the right side back to the wrong side. I like to take it across here, and weave it in going across this way. So, Because if I come this way, then I've kind of left that little weak spot um, open. So I like to come across to the left and I'll just slip my needle through from the right side to the wrong side and I'll pull it through snug. And that helps um, keep it nice and smooth. You can see that I've got it nice and smooth now. I don't have as much of a divot there as I did before. So now that I've got it around to the wrong side of the fabric on the back side, I'm going to weave in this end the same as I did on the hem. So I've got my column of knit stitches right here and I'm gonna put my yarn into this side of it. So I'm going to look at how the yarn goes. It comes around and then through, and around and then through. So I'm gonna follow that path with my needle. So weave it around like this can sometimes get kind of finicky. I can usually do a few stitches at a time and then I have to pull it through because there's just too much resistance to keep moving easily. And you can see it's disappeared into there. Or you can just go one at a time. There we are, we're down to the base of the stockinette fabric. I'm gonna show you a little bit of a different way to weave in here. We duplicate stitch down here at the hem, down here. But up here we're gonna do a little bit different. This is a bind off method that's only okay on a wool yarn. Don't do this on a plant fiber yarn. But you can see how we've got the little bumps and they're kind of like 
a little bit of an upside down U. We're gonna come through these ones, the ones that were going through the bottom of the U. So I'm gonna find that here, and we're gonna go at a diagonal. The first one's not always not, not always a perfect diagonal. So we're gonna go at a diagonal through those little upside down U's. And we're gonna travel a little ways. You can see I'm just sliding my needle underneath. We're going at a diagonal across. I've pretty much got my whole needle underneath, so I'm gonna pull it through. I'm gonna kind of work the fabric a little bit to make sure it's not pulled too tight. And I'm gonna turn this around and I'm gonna come back alongside it this direction. I'm trying to make sure that I'm centered in the video here. So I'm gonna just gonna come here. You might have a little jump right here where you're switching directions. And I'm gonna do that same thing going up. We're coming into the bottom of those little use from the stitch on the back and I'm going to go up until I don't want to get too close to the neckline so I'm going to only going to go that far pull it through make sure it's not too tight and now I'm going to do once more again in the opposite direction I'm going to go this way I just really like to have my ends very secure I don't want to have to worry about things coming undone I'm not gonna go as far this time, just to there. Pull it through. Make sure my fabric isn't bunched up. And again, I'm gonna cut it off, but not right flush with the fabric. I'm gonna leave, ooh, there's a nice focus. I'm gonna leave a little tiny tail right there. So that's another method you can use to weave in the ends. Now we're gonna talk about how to weave in the ends that are just in the middle of your sweater from where you joined a new ball of yarn. You can see that they kind of have a direction. They come up towards the neckline. This is the neckline up here. They come up, they don't come down. So if we go down with them, you're gonna end up pulling at the fabric a little bit. You see you make a little hole there. So we wanna go up with them as we weave them in. So I'm gonna just separate one off and put it onto my needle. Now I'm gonna go up, up and away this direction so I don't create a hole. I'm gonna find the nearest place where the yarn begins to go through its loops so that I can jump in and do duplicate stitch there. So I'm looking, I'm looking. This is an increase, so it looks a little bit funny, but if I come back here behind the increase, I can start following that yarn as we go up to make sure that we don't pull it down and create a hole. Now we're gonna follow this yarn through, hang on, where did it go? Through this way, then we're gonna come down through this bump. Then it comes around this way and through this bump. You're just following that single strand of yarn as it travels through the stitches. And we're just gonna go away from where, from where the yarn ball was joined. Since I have these two strands of yarn at the same place, I'm gonna take the one that's on the left and I'm gonna take it to the left. The one that's on the right, I'm gonna take it to the right. So I'm weaving them in opposite directions so I don't end up with one area of the fabric that is really thick because then you might be able to tell where you wove in your ends. So I'm doing them in opposite directions away from each other to make sure that I don't create a spot where you can see that something is different in that section of fabric. I've only got about an inch and a half, but I'm gonna call that good. I have two little boys playing in a room upstairs and I don't know how long they're going to stay there for. <laughs> so here I'm gonna weave in my other end, putting it on my needle. And again, we're not gonna come down because that will pull a hole into my fabric. I'm gonna go up so that I can make sure I don't create a hole there. And I'm gonna find the nearest spot I can jump into a 
duplicate stitch scenario. I'm going to go right under this one. I'm going up and then I'm going to go out to the right. So I'm going to follow it around this way. If you want to use the diagonal method I just showed you at the neckline in these spots, that's totally fine to do too. It's just this method of following the stitches and, and basically duplicate stitching on the wrong side of the fabric is my favorite way to do it. So that's why I do this, this method. About lost my yarn there. My end is getting a little bit short here, so it's kind of a strain to have enough room to bring my needle around. Oh, and it came off. So I'm calling that good. Cut that one off. Now we're going to move on to fixing these holes in the underarm. Here we are fixing the hole in the underarm. We've got this giant hole. Remember that when I was separating for body and sleeves, I did a sleeve where I didn't pick up extra stitches to purposefully create this enormous hole so that I can show you how to fix it. So this is my yarn from when I um, started picking up for sleeves again. This is the yarn tail from when I attached it. Mine is about a foot long. You need a nice long piece in order to do this much. You can try it if you've got a shorter piece, but you might not have enough and you might have to just use another piece of yarn to do this with. But I've got about a foot of yarn here, so I know I'll have enough. So what I'm gonna do to close up this hole, you can see this is, this is the yarn is attached here. So I'm gonna pull that snug and then I'm going to take my tapestry needle and I'm going to weave around the edges of this hole and I'm going to cinch it closed. So I'm down here at the bottom of the hole and I'm looking for places where I can put my needle through a secure place. Like this spot right here, if I put my needle through and pull that yarn tight, I'm just going to create a hole in a different spot. So I want to come down here to this stitch looks pretty secure and I'm going to slide my needle under there and I'm going to come under this stitch here. I'm looking for another one. I'm going to come under this one here. I'm going to pull my yarn through just so I can have a little more flexibility in how I point my needle. Then I'm going to come around over here. I'm going to grab this one. Now, this one right here is really tempting, but if I grab that one and pull, I'm just going to create a new hole. So I'm going to grab this one here, this one here, this one here. Now we've gone through six stitches now and we're not quite back around to the beginning so I'm going to grab this one here this one here and then go underneath you might be able to hear the boys in the background they have a giant box that they are playing with so I've woven all the way around the hole I've got my yarn going all the way around the hole and now I'm just going to pull it tight I want to pull it nice you don't want to pull it so tight that you make like a puckery bump there you can see here on the other side this is where it's at you don't I don't even know if it's possible to make a puckery bump there let's see let's pull it tighter no I don't think you can so pull it nice and snug and you can see my hole has disappeared because when I wove my yarn through those secure stitches those secure stitches didn't stretch out. They just pulled the whole fabric in and they closed this hole up. So now you have no hole here, which is an easy enough fix. Here's what it looks like from the wrong side. The hole was right here before, or this is the right side, sorry. The hole was right here where my finger is. It was right there and now it is gone. So now I'm gonna look at the other side of my underarm. I fixed the hole on this side. Now I'm looking over here this is kind of loose. I want to do that same weaving and cinching trick over here, but I don't want to have to weave in a whole bunch of new ends. So what I'm going to do with my 
yarn, if you just bring it straight across, you're gonna end up creating a really tight and constricted band here. Because remember, knit fabric stretches. So if I just weave my, in, my needle through straight across, then I've got a straight strand of yarn coming across here that's gonna prevent the stretching. So I want to make sure to maintain that stretch. So I'm gonna take my needle and I'm gonna go up. So I'm finding the nearest, this is the sleeve up here, this is the sleeve, this is the body. I'm gonna go up on the sleeve and I'm gonna kinda of go up and then down. So I'm looking for the nearest spot where I can bump underneath a pearl bump and I'm gonna do the diagonal weave in trick across about halfway, about halfway across. I think I'm about halfway right here. And I'm gonna pull it through we're coming up at an angle, and then I'm gonna turn my sweater and I'm gonna come down towards the underarm. I'm coming down around on this side, which is okay. Totally fine to do that. So now I've woven my ends across and it's still stretchy, okay? We don't want that to be too inflexible. Now I've got this hole here, but I've also got, like you can see it's really loose here and it's really loose here. So I'm gonna come around that whole area. I'm not just gonna come around this one hole. I'm just gonna go around the whole area and cinch that in. So here's a secure stitch. Here's one. I'm gonna come under this one. Oh, well, I'm kind of changing angle there. So I'm gonna pull my yarn through, then kind of change my angle. We're gonna come down this way. I'm gonna come across the bottom now. I'm gonna grab this one and then I'm gonna turn the corner and come around. And now this is the underarm here. This is the stitches in the underarm and I'm gonna come under there to finish off with. Now I'm gonna pull that snug. You can see that pulled my loose spot up perfectly. Now be careful. Remember you wove in this way and then this way. If you pull super tight, you're just gonna pull these stitches that you wove in at a diagonal through these stitches and you're just gonna end up cinching up the bottom of your sleeve. So be careful, get your hole closed up, but don't pull it so tight that you pull these stitches and make a pucker in the bottom of your sleeve. You can see we're still stretchy. Everything looks good. We don't have a hole on this side. We don't have a hole on this side. And now we just need to weave in this end. And for the final weaving in, I like to come down into the body. So I'm gonna come and I'm gonna start doing the duplicate stitch method. Now this strand of yarn has a lot of work to do basically. It's got a lot, a lot relying on it. I don't want this to pop out and come unraveled. Also, it's in a really high stress area. The underarm is the high, like one of the highest stress areas. It stretches a lot when you're putting the sweater on and off. So I want to make sure this is woven in really securely so it doesn't come undone as I'm stretching the sweater out in this area and so that my hole shows up again. I'm gonna come across the entire underarm, weaving duplicate stitch. I'm gonna do a couple more here because we're not all the way across. Now, I'm finishing up here, but you can see my needle is coming in the direction of going down into the sweater body. That's the one I'm gonna end on. And I'm gonna move down a little bit so that I can start working duplicate stitch again. So I'm gonna come behind this loop, but I wanna jump down a couple, couple rows. So I'm jumping down a little bit, and now I'm gonna start working in duplicate stitch again, but I've gotta look for a place where I can begin. So I'm gonna begin right here and I'm gonna work the opposite direction. First we worked this way, now I'm gonna work that way. So I'm just gonna do duplicate stitch across the entire width of the armhole again, just to make sure that this little yarn tail is really secure. I do not want this coming undone. I don't even want it loosening up. So I'm making it really super duper secure. You might hear the dog at the door now. Everybody's come home and is, is living in this house again. Okay. 
Okay, there we go. I've gone across again, and now I'm going to trim this end. Remember, I'm leaving a little bit so that when you stretch it, you can see, oh, where's the end? There's the end. I'm stretching it, and you can see that it really wants to go back through, but I've made it long enough that it's not quite making it. Remember that your fabric is going to stretch sometimes. So here's the side that had the giant holes, and you can see the holes are gone. Let's look at it from the right side. Here we go. The holes are gone. There was a giant hole here, and now it's just all nice and smooth. There's not even a bump there. There's not even a giant lump there. And on this side, no hole, nice and smooth. And you can see there is no visible area where we've woven in the ends. The hole is gone. Everything is nice, seamless, and looks perfect. Now let's go over to the other underarm and weave that one in. You'll remember that this is the underarm on which we picked up extra stitches. So you can see there's a little bit of looseness on this side. A little bit, not a ton. And on this side, this is the side where we would have had a massive, massive hole. You can see there's still a little tiny, tiny hole there, but it's not really that bad. We're going to do our little trick where we cinch it closed again. I'm gonna thread my needle. Here's my hole, here's my yarn. We're going to remember, come underneath the secure stitches that are around the edge. This hole is much smaller, so it's not gonna require me to go through as many stitches as I work around. It's a little bit loose up here at the top. I think I wanna tighten that up too, so I'm gonna come up one more stitch. I'm gonna come across and start coming down the other side. And I'm coming back down around to the beginning. The dog wants in. It's, you can possibly hear the doorstep squeaks when she stomps on it. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't in the screen really well. So I've gone all the way around the hole and I just pull it tight. And there we go. The hole is gone, it's all nicely cinched up. Brenna, can you let Daisy in please? It's all nicely cinched up. Everything is closed up, there's no hole anymore. Now I'm gonna move across to the other side of the underarm and again, I'm gonna do that trick where I weave the, end, the yarn going up and then back down again so that we can maintain the flexibility. So we're gonna go under here. And I'm sorry for the noisiness. I'm gonna go up. Up a couple steps, then we're gonna come back down a couple steps. Make sure I'm still in the screen. Can you be a little bit quiet, please, Brenna? Be a little bit quiet, please. So here we are with the holes here in the underarm that we're gonna close these ones up. So we're gonna come around the top of the hole. Oh, I'm saying the top because that's the part that's away from me. Come around that side and make sure you're picking up in those secure loops. I'm gonna skip over the one in the middle. Coming around the bottom, coming around to this is where the underarm starts. That's the end of the underarm. So I'm gonna pull those snug and we're gonna cinch that hole closed too. You can see it's all closed up. It's nice and neat. On the other side, it's all closed up. It's nice and neat. So now I'm going to weave in this end just like I did on the other underarm. I'm gonna come down so that I'm coming downwards. I'm going to weave it in with duplicate stitch. I'm on the right-hand side of the underarm, so I'm gonna to move to the left at first. Okay, just close the door and leave her in the mudroom. The dog is soaked. Coming across. We're coming across to the left and I'm gonna just go the distance of the underarm again. Brenna, can you please not play a noisy game right here while I'm filming?
Okay, now I'm, I've got my needle coming down towards the body, so that's the one I'm gonna end on. And then I'm gonna come down a couple steps, a couple rows, right there, and then I'm gonna move up. I've come down a couple rows, and now I'm going to duplicate stitch my way across the underarm, going from left to right. So I've gotta find a good spot to jump in. I'm gonna come and start over here. And come up this way and I'm just going to work across to the other side of the underarm and make sure that this is really nicely secured because once again I don't want this oops, I'm almost losing it I don't want this yarn end to come unraveled or come loose at all Now I'm gonna trim this again, leave a little bit, leave a little bit of yarn there when you trim those ends. Okay, now I'm gonna weave in, I've just got the two ends on the sleeve cuffs. You know what, we'll just do that together. We can weave in ends together. Ooh, I need to show you how to fix this. Okay, so this is the sleeve cuff that I didn't finish nicely. You know how I pick up the through the top of the first bound off stitch? This is the sleeve cuff that I did not do that on. You can see I've got a giant step there. So I'm going to fix that together with you here, just in case you have this problem. So my last bound off stitch, I'm gonna flip this around. I'll prefer to work this way where I'm weaving away from myself. You can see my last bound off stitch is over to the right and I need to bridge this gap here so that I can have a secure line. So I'm gonna take my tapestry needle and I'm gonna find the very top of the first bound off stitch. It is right here. You can see the little V there. And I'm gonna start by putting my yarn through there. And I'm gonna draw it through tightly. Then I'm gonna come around to my last bound off stitch. So this is, this is the hole. I'm gonna come through this stitch again, the top of this stitch again, to make sure that we are binding this closed nicely. It's not gonna give us a perfect finish. And then I'm gonna go through the first bound off stitch on the other side again. It's not gonna give us a perfect join. You've still got a little divot right here, but it's a lot better than it was. So now I've got my little stair step fixed and I'm gonna weave in ends. And this is my column of knit stitches. I'm gonna weave it in this side down to the sleeve. So I'm looking at how my yarn goes around and off we go around and around and around to weave in this end. Oops, I've got a little knot there. I've come down to the bottom of the ribbing and I think I'm gonna go up at a diagonal this time just show you how that one works one more time. You can see I'm just coming underneath the upside down bumps of the stitches. Bumps, I don't know if you would call it that. I'll just come across until my tapestry needle is full, pull it through, and then I'm gonna come through the other direction. I have a um, hand knit garment that my great grandmother made. And she did not weave in her ends like this. I thought it was very interesting. She went up like this, just straight up underneath, which I thought was very interesting to see. But you can see that from the front side, so. 
that's not how we weave in ends here. So I've done two diagonals, that's enough for here. I'm going to cut this off. Remember, leave a little bit of extra yarn. Because remember, when you stretch that sleeve, when you put it on, oh no, look, it even came through. I didn't quite leave enough. All right, this is the last end. This is the last end, yeah, that's an extra one. Okay, here's the last end. This is the side that we joined nice and neat by picking up the top of the la the first stitch that you bound off and then binding that off. So you can see we don't have a giant stair step there. It's much better. There's my needle. This is the last stitch that I bound off over here on the right. I'm gonna to come to the left one little spot and bring my yarn through from the right side to the wrong side, pull it snug. I am identifying my knit column of stitches and I'm going to weave my end through one leg of that. Oops, this does not want to lay flat. Round and around we go. I've pulled it too tight, you can see I pulled that down, but you can just pull it back up again if you do that. Keep going until you reach the bottom. Now I'm going to hop up a couple rows and then I'm going to duplicate stitch away. And come through here and start. Oops, my needle came right off. We'll call that good. Maybe this time I'll cut with a little, a little bit extra. Will it pop through when I stretch it? Uh, this time I left enough. Okay, now we've woven on all of the ends. Here is our little sweater. All of the ends are woven in. I'm gonna turn it right side round. Here we go. Here is our sweater. You can see that it's got all lumps and bumps and rumples. And now we are going to go block this little sweater. Now it's time to block our little sweater. I always block my sweaters in the bathroom sink. The reason I like to do it in the bathroom is because it's a small, it's a manageable size for even adult size sweaters for myself. And it drains from the bottom. One thing you need to know is you can never lift your soaking wet knitwear out of the water. We don't want to do that because you're going to distort the fabric. So I want you to put it into something that drains from the bottom. If you don't want to put it in your bathroom sink, you can put it in your kitchen sink or you can put it in your bathtub, but just make sure that you can drain the water out of whatever you're using before you touch your sweater. The temperature of water you're going to use is going to differ based off of what exactly you're blocking. If you are blocking something that you think is going to bleed, like you think the red yarn is going to, or the red dye is going to bleed into the white yarn, then you're going to want to use cold water. If you are blocking something super rustic and crunchy, you're going to want to use the hottest water you possibly can. Otherwise, you're going to use water warm enough to wash a baby. So I've got warm water here. I'm going to use my wool wash. This is my wool wash. I use Eucalan. You can use any kind of wool wash. There's a lot of different ones. This is the one I use. So I'm going to turn on my sink. I have already cleaned my sink. So clean your sink. 
Then turn it on and start the water running. Close your drain plug and pour in some wool wash. You need a teaspoon or two. I just pour it in. You can measure. Uh, maybe you could use the cap and do a cap full. But I just pour in a little dollop. Here is my sweater, all ready to go in the bath. Pour your wool wash in as you're filling up the sink so that your wool wash is nicely distributed in the water before you put your sweater in. I've got some nice bubbles. I don't need very much water because it's a tiny little sweater. You're gonna put your sweater in and you're gonna push it under the water push it all under and you can even squeeze it. We're doing like a squeezing motion, never twist, never ever twist. So we're gonna squeeze it just to get the air out of the fabric and let the water soak in. Make sure it's all under the water. You don't wanna grab it and pull it and lift it because you're gonna distort the fabric. You don't wanna wring it and twist it because you're gonna distort the fabric. Shove it under water. Make sure it's well saturated. You're gonna let it soak for at least 15 minutes. If you're doing something that you're worried it's going to bleed, only do it for 15 minutes. At 15 minutes, take it out, set a timer or something, take it out right away. If it's something that you're not worried about it's gonna bleed, then I usually leave it in until the water is cool. So depending on how hot your water is, how cold your house is, that could take an hour, it could take a couple hours. Sometimes I will forget about it and leave it for hours and hours, but if it's not bleeding, that's fine. You want to leave it for at least 15 minutes. Now I've got a towel here. I'm gonna move the camera. Sorry for the shaky uh, camera work. I have a towel sitting here. It's ready to go for when my sweater is done soaking. For an adult sized sweater or even an older child sized sweater, I'll use a bath towel and I'll do this on the floor. You wanna make sure you can lay this out flat. But since this is a baby sweater, I'm just gonna use a dish towel on the sink. So I'm gonna let this soak for 15 minutes and then I'm gonna come back and show you what we do there. Okay, we're done soaking. It's been 15 minutes. It's nice and saturated. We're going to push down the plunger and we're gonna let all of the water drain out. I'll pull the sweater away from the drain sometimes to help that process go. With a wool wash, you don't need to rinse at all. I'm gonna push it over here so you can actually see. It's bubbly, don't worry about the bubbles. I'm gonna push it against the side of the sink and I'm just gonna squeeze different parts of the sweater. I'm not twisting, I'm not lifting, I'm just squeezing the water out. I want to get as much water out as I can in the sink just by squeezing it with my hands. Now I'm going to scoop the whole thing up with my hands. You don't want to grab an edge of it and lift. You want to scoop the whole thing up with your hands so that the weight of it is always supported and move it to your towel. Now it's on your towel. Nobody wants to see my toilet. Here we are on the towel. You're going to lay it out flat flattish. You don't have to worry about it being super duper neat at this point. You're going to lay it out on your towel. I'm going to fold in the bottoms and the top. Then you're going to roll it up in your towel. If you're doing this on the floor in a bath towel, you can step on it and walk on it or you can have your kids do that. Since we're in here, I'm just going to squeeze it with my hands. We're trying to soak as much water out of the sweater as possible and into the towel. That way it dries a lot quicker and your sweater isn't as heavy and it's a lot easier to manage as you're laying it out, trying to get it nicely blocked. So here we go. It's pretty dry. We're gonna go lay it out to block it. Right, we're ready to lay out our sweater and block it. You'll notice that I have it laying on this foam pad. This is just a foam pad for um, putting underneath uh, workout machines or exercise machines. I have four of them that I can put together if I'm doing something big. It's non-absorbent and I can very easily just stick things into it if I need to pin something out. This is an excellent option. You can also buy expensive blocking mats, but I think this is much cheaper. Do not lay it out on an absorbent surface like a bed or carpet. 
Don't lay it on top of a towel. It will take a really long time to dry if you lay it out on something like that because the water will soak into the absorbent thing underneath and then it will have to dry out of the sweater and then out of the thing underneath and it will take forever. If you have to lay it on an absorbent surface like a bed, then put a trash bag or some layer of plastic underneath the sweater. That way the water doesn't soak down into the thing underneath and take forever to dry. So we're gonna take our little sweater here, make sure I'm in the screen, and we're just going to lay it out. Like I said before, I don't really stretch things when I'm blocking them. I just kind of lay them out flat and I smooth the fabric out. The yoke needs to be smoothed out. The sleeves need to be smoothed. I'll make sure the ribbing is laying flat and I'll just smooth it with my hands. Keep in mind, knit fabric is really suggestible. If I push down firmly and push it outward, I can change the size of the sweater quite dramatically. So I don't wanna push really hard. I'm just gently smoothing my hands over it. If I have a little bump like over here on the top of the sleeve, I'll use my fingers to kind of gently smooth that out because I don't want ripples at the top of my sleeves. I want everything to sit nice and smooth and even. Make sure everything, the ribbing is laying flat. I'm smoothing all of the wrinkles out. Like if it's all wrinkled and crinkled like this, it usually is when you lay it down to block it, it's all wrinkled. Just a gentle smoothing of the hand is enough to get all of those out. I'll kind of pull the yoke up a little bit to stretch that out and make sure it lays flat. I'm not stretching it out a ton. I'm just making sure the shoulders come up because they do like to tend to stay down a little bit. Smooth them up to their proper place and just gently remove any wrinkles or bumps. And there it is laying flat. One thing I do really like to do when I'm blocking sweaters is you can see the bottom of the ribbing likes to suck in. I really hate it when it does that. So I'll take a couple of my blocking combs. Oop, trying to get out another one without stabbing myself. I'll take a couple blocking combs and I'll put my finger inside the ribbing and I'll kind of stretch it a little bit, not past the edge of the sweater. You can see here's the side of the body coming down. I'll just kind of bring it even to the side of the body and put a blocking comb in there because I just really don't like it when the ribbing sucks in like that. I know that as soon as I start wearing it, that ribbing is gonna stop doing that, but still it annoys me. So I, I like to block that out like that. I make sure the bottom here is completely even. I don't wanna have the underside, you know, pushed way up or pulled way down. I wanna make sure that's all perfectly even along the hem. That's one place where you can really see when things are distorted is right at the hem. I make sure that the neckline is laying nice. The way it dries is the way it's going to want to stay. So I make sure my neckline is laying nice. I make sure my uh, ribbing at my cuffs is laying nice. You can see they're a little bit pinched in. I don't worry about that because I know the very first time I put this sweater on, that ribbing is going to form to the shape of my arm and my wrist and I'm not gonna have to worry about that. I just make sure that the ends of the cuff are laying even with each other like this. I don't wanna have something where it's laying like this. That will just be funky. I just make sure they're nice and even. Everything is nice and even and smoothed out. And now we wait for it to dry. Thank you so much for joining me in the How to Knit a Sweater class. Your sweater is now laid out to dry. Here's mine. As soon as it's dry, you can pop it on and wear it endlessly. If you enjoyed this class, please share it with all of your knitting friends so that they can knit their first sweater too, or perhaps they can find some tips and tricks in here if they have already knit their first sweater. There's a lot of information in here that a lot of people might find valuable, so please share it with your knitting friends. Please also subscribe to my newsletter. The link is down in the description box below this video. And if you really enjoyed this video and would like to see more videos of mine, 
Please subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can see all of my knitting podcasts and tutorials as they come out. I hope you knit lots and lots of sweaters, and I hope you stay absolutely cozy in all of your fantastic new sweaters.